Well, greetings everybody and welcome to yet another edition of that wonderful show we call the In World Review. This is the place, the program where we discuss news and um, various topics uh, concerning the metaverse. And for those of you who don't know, the metaverse is the world of immersive collaborative spaces, 3D spaces online, and um, probably the future of virtual reality. Yes, social social networks. Uh, we also do cover a little bit about um, other aspects of interfacing, including um, the, 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 the more general phrase VR these days, which includes surround vision and uh, many other things. Uh, but it's all to do with interfacing, so he picks up the leap motion and flips the page for the next item. Yes, except he doesn't actually, but we can pretend. You get the idea, folks, you get the idea. So uh, we're back um, again uh, this week in our main studios here, our headquarters um, uh, for Metaworld Broadcasting on the great Canadian grid. And um, it's worthy of noting that uh, the great Canadian grid is very happy. Yes. <laughs> um, that a few extra regions went on sale um, about a week ago um, to uh, top it up to um, the, um, the, the top out amount, so to speak. And um, uh, those um, went pretty quickly. Uh, there are a few extra regions being brought online right now. The, um, as a present for residents, uh, the Great Canadian Grid has offered to people who own land already um, a special uh, full region sim for uh, $10 for one week only is um, just a few extra regions to say thank you for the people who stuck it out during the denial of de distributed denial of service attacks and um, I will point that um, point out that um, the security systems in Canada are now extremely robust um, uh, you basically have to jump through over three walls to get in, but if you are a resident or uh, an approved um, hypergrid jumper, you won't notice you're jumping over them. But behind the scenes, you will be. <laughs> yes, you will be. <laughs> and um, uh, the Canada has issued an apology to some people uh, because during di distributed denial of service attacks, um, some people who are actually bona fide residents or hypergrid visitors may have been affected by a botnet. Um, this a botnet is a, you know, your computer is actually used and un unknown to you as part of the attack. And apparently a few people who are genuine residents through no fault of their own have computers infected um, because their IP addresses are now blacklisted. Um, you get blocked at the first wall. Um, I, I, the obvious solution here to anybody worried about this is don't forget your virus scanner. Run your virus scanner to check you're not infected with Trojans, viruses, or, or botnets, or anything else like that. It's often even worth running two, you know, whatever one you use normally, and maybe an extra one to double check. Um, a, a person in point from me this week, um, I th actually, it might have been the week before, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I, um, I actually reinstalled my favorite antivirus software called Avast, A V A S T. Um, no plug intended. <laughs> but I've done it, um, and um, basically because um, I, I, you know, the um, things were going slow on Windows 10, and um, it immediately found two viruses and fixed them immediately. And Windows 10 has now speeded up again, and I've come to the conclusion that basically the the creature called Windows Defender, which is also is supposed to have Microsoft Security Essentials, which used to be good, now integrated into it is best not played with. It's, it clearly doesn't work, and it's so busy scanning that it doesn't want you to let you do any work. So um, my, my suggestion is to switch it off and install a proper professional and, uh, malware scanner instead of what Microsoft profess to be one. And not only that, you'll get a better job done and you'll speed up your system a bit. Ha, ha, ha. All right, and uh, with barely a month to go before the so-called anniversary updates, um, who knows? Who knows? You may have to do it all over again. Um, anyway, anyway, that's a little aside. And... Um, yeah, now, um, first off, um, I, well, first of all, let me introduce who's here. We haven't got any uh, actual guests this week. Uh, joining us um, on the uh, seat, so to speak, we've got uh, James Outloud, who's also um, running our multiple cameras here as well, multitasking. So good to see you, James. 
Oh yeah, it's great to be here. I am so thrilled to be a participant in this program and the topics. And uh, you know, viruses, uh, virus protection on your computer, malware protection is just a fact of life. Uh, I've been using a program called Viper that has changed owners yeah. several times, but boy, it's it's worked great for me. So de definitely go out and do that. Apparently, um, actually, this is of interest. A lot of people swear by Kapersky. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Although I've heard uh, rumors that they're not as good as they used to be. And also, I did notice that Vast, the one I just mentioned, um, actually bought uh, during the course of this week AVG, which is their main competitor. So AVG is now part of a Vast. Uh, I guess uh, two, two scanners work better than one <laughs> altogether. Um, yes, so um, yeah, good point there. Um, yeah, so long as you use something and so long as it's a reputable name and down those new definitions every hour or two, you should be okay. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Well, we'll chat later, James. Good to see you, of course. Thanks. And um, on my other side, of course, my regular co host is Maria Koroloff from uh, Hypergrid Business and other places. So, uh, welcome, Maria. Uh, hi, Mel. Thank you for having me here today. Now, um, I uh, basically it's just going to be catch up on news and stuff this week, um, of which the, um, the, uh, there is um, uh, a fair bit. Um, uh, most of it, however, is not directly concerned um, with the hypergrid, but I'd normally hand over at this point to Maria to um, comment on the um, specific hypergrid business. So I'll do that now, Maria, if you're up for it. I know there's one thing at least. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, uh, yes, yeah, so I haven't done a story about uh, the Great Canadian Grid yet. Um, I contacted Roddy and he told me that they fixed their, their issues with mm. the, um, uh, the, the attacks. Uh, so what, what, they, what was happening was that there was a flood of false connections coming in, too many for the grid to handle, um, mm. and so the grid would go down when that happens. So they've, um, they've been trying different techniques over the past month or so trying to get this thing fixed and he says they finally got it uh, under control uh, he didn't want to give me any details for exactly what they did uh, because he says he doesn't want to give the bad guys any you know any any clues for how to get around it in the future uh, but he says if people have similar problems if other grid owners uh, also face uh, these kinds of attacks uh, they're called distributed denial of service attacks then they can contact him and he'd be glad to help. Um, and um, speaking of outages, uh, OS Grid had an outage of three days this week. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't, uh, uh, the, the problem was people couldn't get access to their assets and assets are everything that exists on the grid, your inventory items, the stuff that's lying around on the regions, pretty much all, all this stuff. Um, and um, it wasn't an open SIM issue. It was a configuration issue with the, the, the database clusters. And uh, the person who originally set it up was Melanie Thielker. She's the head of the Avenation grid, and she lives out in Europe, and she was moving house. Yeah. So that caused a delay uh, for getting the grid back up because oh, she was the only one huh. who knew what was going on. <laughs> And uh, there were some complaints about the communications uh, because it went down on Wednesday and the first tweets didn't go out until Thursday uh, about what was happening. Um, there was some information on, uh, on the, the OS Grid chat uh, platform. But yeah. so if you happen to be in the OS Grid chat at exactly the right time, you would have found out what was going on Otherwise, people were searching around and they couldn't find anything, and they were getting a little frustrated. I did um, notice a post on Google Plus. Um, I think it was yesterday, saying sort of, um, um, "Sorry about the lack of communication." Or something. They said followers on Facebook or better still on Google Plus, and any updates are actually there. And I, I suddenly picked it up pretty quickly. I noticed right. some said, "I can't get in." <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, you have to hunt around for those things. It should yeah. be on the website. And yeah. so that when you go to the website, it's right there. And it's not that hard to do because there's there's the news thing that you can do. And there's tweets. Um, you, all you have to do is put up a tweet and it automatically comes back, comes up, shows up yeah. on the front page. So, and you can tweet from your from your phone from your computer from anything 
So there's really no excuse not to put out a tweet right away saying the grid is down. We know what's going on. Uh, you're not going to lose anything because that's it's not that kind of problem. We're getting it fixed. You know, it will keep you posted. Something simple so, like that. It's also very useful, uh, you, 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 easy. Um, well, if it's your home grid, anyway, um, for grids to actually um, put embedded news widgets on their login page. So if I come to Canada and it's down for an hour or so or something, I'll see a notice saying so back in an hour or something like that. Um, so, you know, it's, um, yeah, it should be pretty easy to keep your residents informed. Um, but, um, yeah, well, not, not all of them do it. <laughs> Quite frankly. <laughs> what the, yeah, what but I do have to say, say that, um, uh, yeah, and they do also have the tweets on their splash page too. So if they put out a tweet, it will automatically update both their home page and their login screen. So, oh. um, so, so that's a, like it's an easy, easy, quick way to get everybody updated. So, so people will know whether they if they follow the Twitter feed or if they just go to the website. Which is the website is usually the first place people check. I do have to say they were pretty quick about it. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously a day is a long time for residents who have stuff going on and can't get into the grid. Yeah. Um, so um, and uh, simultaneously, uh, OpenSimulator.org also happened to go down for a little bit. So <laughs> that, I, mean, that <laughs> I, I actually was quite heartened because um, on Friday, which is when they were down, although I think it, uh, maybe it was late Friday they came back up, but um, yeah, the, the, the OS Grid actually have their weekly party. Uh, sorry, my headphones are falling off. Hang on. <laughs> it sounded uh, like something like that was happening. So yeah, they're just slipping down the back of my neck. Okay. Right. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, uh, they were very quick to uh, redeploy there. I mean, there were two events that were meant to happen on the OS grid that simply happened on other places on the hypergrid that they arranged at the last minute, and they suddenly got news out about that. So um, that was good to see. You know, the, the OS grid weekly party happened as normal, except not on OS grid. <laughs> I forget which grid it, which grid it was on, but yeah. So, grid owners out there, if um, it, it, um, in anticipation of things going wrong, very occasionally they might, you never know. Mm -hmm. Get some kind of new service set up so you can let at least your own residents know. <laughs> true, true. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so, yeah, so that's what was going on there. And, and again, I do have to say that uh, once they did start communicating, they did communicate on multiple channels, uh, they put up a news alert. Um, they did the Twitter. Uh, they responded by email to me pretty quickly, um, so that was nice. Um, and um, uh, so o overall, it wasn't wasn't a bad experience. Um, com better communications was one of the the things that was going to be a top priority when Dan Banner took over in yeah. April. Um, and I, I have to say, this, this wasn't that bad. I mean, there were uh, on forums, in Google Plus, in Twitter. And in the, in the news alerts, um, they did have the message, so uh, they did keep people posted about what was going on, and uh, they did uh, say when the grid was back up. So um, overall, I have to say, it wasn't that bad. Um, and for for the first round of you know a grid emergency, um, I'm sure they can work out the some of the uh, the kinks as they go along. So hopefully next time it'll go faster. Um, but um, not too bad. Um, now, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Grid, OS Grid is the oldest and largest grid running on the OpenSim platform. They've been around for a really long time. They're celebrating their ninth birthday uh, this summer. And all the spots, uh, all the vendor spots in their exhibition regions are already taken. I don't know if they're going to be opening up more or not, because at least one person has been contacting me saying that maybe that they should put something up on there. Um, so I'll, I'll have to contact Dan and find out about that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, OS Grid is an experimental grid. They do a lot of testing of OpenSim. They do a lot of work on helping it develop. Uh, so they are not a good production grid. Um, if you need something that is where, where you don't have unexpected downtime, where you schedule the upgrades yourself, where you're running on a previous version of OpenSim that's been tested, known to be stable, 
You mm. want to have your own private grid. It doesn't mean you're isolated. You can turn on the hypergrid so you can still have friends and teleport around to anywhere you want. Um, but even if you have your own grid, it's the development work that's on OS grid that makes it all possible. And they are looking for donations. Um, specifically, uh, they're, they're looking for regular monthly donations so they can budget for their servers and everything else. And I do recommend that people uh, support that grid. It is definitely a big asset to the community. Boom. Yep, and, that, and that's... Um... That's if I... <laughs> 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 yep. uh, wait, wait. Oh, I, I do want to say the, tre the uh, hypergrid treasure hunt is still on and there's uh, right. recently started. There's still time to get in on it. There's still time to support it. Yeah. And uh, four of the regions downstairs here are on, on it so this time around. I, I haven't put all 12 on it, but <laughs> at least I got four up. So <laughs> there we go. All very easy clues, except for one which is devilishly hard. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, let's, um, let me move on to the, um, the posts that have come up in the week. Oh, I, I have got one thing up here on my other machine, <laughs> interestingly. Uh, we all know about, you know, uh, Second Life and Open Sim Photography, as it's called. Um, nice pictures taken in world. Um, I, 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 I stumbled across um, a, a site called fineartamerica.com. Uh, during the week, and um, I'm not going to read out. Well, that's their that's their name. I can't actually give you the announcement number because it's it announcement HTML question mark ID equals, and you have got to be kidding. You will need a virus scanner to read that, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, this um, uh, this features somebody called Elizabeth Stenger. And she said, I was looking for galleries of hope, a place where homeless, disabled, and other low-income individuals could post their work in an effort to keep a roof over their head. Now, I don't know whether she qualifies as that or whether she's what, but um, uh, she's been selling this painting there called Air Dance. And um, <laughs> I, was quite, I was quite astonished because it is a second life or open sim um, photograph. In fact, it's not... Is aesthetically pleasing enough? It's nothing special, actually, but I was just surprised to find it listed, you know, not even a commercial art site, but fine art, America. <laughs> fine, <laughs> fine art, indeed. So I guess congratulations to Elizabeth Stengo, who's managed to pass off a, um, an in world uh, photograph as fine art, indeed. <laughs> hey, there's people throwing splatters of paint on a canvas and passing that off as fine art. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And doing like, much, much worse things that yeah. I don't even want to, you know, mention in a family show. No, so... <laughs> I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, um, I, I, I was sort of congratulating her on making it into the fine art trade. I mean, you know, first, uh, first time for anything, really. I wasn't really criticizing. It's not something I would pay much money to buy, to be honest, myself. But I like art, and I have my own particular taste in art. So there you go. There's just too much art around um, to collect it all, if any of it, in fact. Okay, so um, into the main news so to speak. Uh, now I, I just usually go through my Twitter feed, which you'll find at twitter.com slash Malburns, M-A-L-B-U-R-N-S, or one word. And um, there's links to interfacing stuff, VR stuff, hypergrid stuff, and um, all this sort of general stuff um, regarding OpenSim and um, uh, stuff um, as well. Uh, I do have another Twitter feed, which I'll mention later, but this uh, this is my main one. <laughs> As usual, the week started with a whole load of posts from hypergrid business. I, I, I think I found them the moment the show finished. My my impression was that um, Maria here had probably been posting them while she was talking to us on the show. <laughs> mm -hmm. a, multi, a multitasking, eh, Maria? <laughs> I've got a bunch of them queued up. So I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> Might as well get on with it, yes. <laughs> Why did this I've got a freelance writer who submits them, and I just noticed that I've got I'm, I'm behind uh, on the articles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, while I'm blabbering, you can happily do that. <laughs> okay, um, so um, I think I mentioned this on last week's show anyway. The first post of uh, mine in the week um, seems to be a. Uh, um, uh, a link to the Virtual Garden of Time, which if I remember right, I'm not opening it, but if I remember rightly, it's on Craft Grid. 
and um, looks very nice indeed. Um, apparently, it's, it's designed so you can actually explore um, all four seasons um, of, of the year, so to speak, or all in one um, uh, changing environment. <laughs> um, also, a post uh, came by Flip It. I can't tell you where this came from, but these kind of articles are always very interesting. You'll find the link on my feed. How science fiction writers predicted virtual reality. Um, back to our authors and um, science fiction again there. Um, right. Uh, virtual reality heats up in China. Um, I, th- um, I think... Um, I think oh, well that came by Flip it. It may be Road to VR, but if I if I recall, Maria's got an item on that somewhere this week anyway. Right. Um, <clears throat> um, a post um, on Tuesday, I guess. Virtuality used to treat mental health problems. This was a direct link to a video. So although we've covered that already, uh, this was a specific tweet of um, a video. Um, virtuality-news.net reported that why the VR industry needs more collaboration to succeed <clears throat> uh, voicesofvr.com's podcast number 393 insights into the public perception of VR from viral video reactions um, yeah, audio, audio interview on that podcast and um, I, I actually completely missed this um, you know, I haven't got life. I never go out. Uh, VR, uh, VRLO, um, number five. The London VR meetup highlights. I didn't even know it was happening. But um, anyway, there's, uh, courtesy of Flip It, you can see all the highlights from it. Um, it's a lot of boys uh, with <clears throat> fewer things, <clears throat> mostly, but not totally. Right. Uh, the democratization, de- sorry, the democratization of virtuality brackets VR. Um, another post by Flip It. Let me open that one. I'm quite um, can't remember what that is offhand. Okay, it's um, it's taken me to a site called itproportal.com. I T P R O P O R T A L dot com. Oh, I see. I I T Pro Portal. I think is what that's probably short for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying. I was trying to pronounce it. It's, it's Pro Portal. You know, it's like, what a convoluted name, <laughs> right? Yes, I T Pro Portal. Okay. Um, and um, somebody wrote, uh, somebody called Jonathan Wagstaff uh, wrote us a business feature on um, you know, um, VR finally becoming affordable and it's doing this, that, and it's doing that, other, and uh, well, basically. Uh, talking about the um, um, uh, democratization of it, um, quoting lots of different people, ranging from uh, uh, he starts off talking about Richard Branson is around the world balloon. I'm not sure what's VR about that. Although, although on the sideline, I do notice that Branson is sending up his second spaceship very shortly after the one that crashed. Crashed. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so um, IT uh, portal. I'm going to close that so I can see the rest of my list. Um, a site called hackededucation.com, H A C K E D U C A T I O N. So, yeah, it's hack education, or one word, not hat education. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Marketing, uh, uh, virtuality and education, a history. Um, a little roundup um, of uh, virtuality in education there um, for, for educators um, largely. Um, virtuality slash news.net report on alt <clears throat> alt space VR is breaking the virtual reality isolation barrier um, here of course they're referring to uh, well I, uh, you know always announced at the beginning of the show we're about interactive collaborative creative spaces and um, you know a lot of um, so called VR these days is um, a fairly isolating experience even though it may be great um, super whiz do fun um, so um, Alt Space VR are working on the social side of it and um, another post um, via roadtovr.com I'm going to open this one briefly um, this is another new social VR app and um, as I said, the link comes from roadsvr.com, and it's uh, why a new social VR rec room, as in recreation room, makes you smile. And 
Uh, this is um, this is an app that runs under the HTC Vive thing, so obviously you've got to have a headset sort of thing to um, actually use it. But um, <clears throat> it's down to social VR. Um, the pictures of it are quite interesting, actually. It's got a very cartoony feel to it, but it's not um, a bit like early Second Life. Um, but sort of, um, you know, but a bit prettier in in a sort of way. Um, and uh, the avatars just seem to be very strange sort of shaped things with um, sort of um, balloons that come out of their mouths. But um, anyways, anyways, uh, <clears throat> at the time of writing, more than 100 Steam reviewers gave the game a thumbs up. And, um, of course, they do call it a game. So make your own mind about that. But you can find the post at RedVR.com. <clears throat> right. Virtual reality for sailors with new apps. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the wonderful things right now is the endless articles from that like the, the, just about every sort of walk of life or profession you can imagine in their local press have suddenly discovered VR and they have to publish an article tell, telling you how VR is going to revolutionise their particular industry um, as opposed to the world <laughs> itself. Um, <clears throat> so they tell you that it's no longer science fiction. The uh, picture shows an HT, uh, HTC Vive headset and... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the use of VR for education and enjoyment in sports uh, such as sailing, and um, they they have a um, <clears throat> they have a picture up here as an interface of which rather looks like um, I think this is Melbourne based Marineverse, which was founded this year in Australia, and. Um, you know, it's very rudimentary graphics of the front of a sailing boat, you know, with like a little sort of pop up information. And um, uh, it doesn't really look like it'd be very useful for sailors, but it might actually be quite useful for people who want to learn to sail. So um, work that out if you want. Uh, Marine versus a Google Cardboard product. Um, uh, they got a thing about America's Cup too, but that seems to be a headset job. Um, but anyway, they've had it, uh, you know, from the um, sailing um, aspect, <laughs> uh, they've got a good um, a lot of things there. And I know, actually, that in virtual reality, especially in Second Life, a lot of people are very fond of sailing. You know, they're, they're, they're hunting around saying, where are the water regions? Where are the water regions? <laughs> yeah. And I want me boat. I want me boat. Right. Um, now, you know, um, we have to include um, links like this. Uh, the link actually goes to a site called the Cried, oh, the Cridsdaily.com, T H E C R Y D S D A I L Y.com, the Cridsdaily. Uh, so, Crid apostrophe S is the title of the blog. And it's about that company that used to be big, didn't they, once upon a time? Microsoft. Yeah, well, Microsoft's research, yeah, they've still got a research wing, apparently. Not to, I don't know where they ever came up with anything. Um, on inefficient inter interaction with objects, allows you to feel objects in VR. Okay, I'm going to stop making jokes. Um, they, they have prepared a thing here um, for the SIGGRAPH um, uh, showcases, and it's showing how they created virtual controls that allow to, you to actually feel objects in uh, VR. The idea is be uh, moving it beyond uh, the keyboard and mouse. And uh, it's um, the photo, well, uh, you know, uh, this is research, I guess, although they have got it to the point of um, demonstrating it. The project is called Hand Pose. Gosh, that's a really original name. When did Microsoft think up that one? Right, um, Hand Pose. The photograph actually shows somebody wearing... Uh, what looks like um, one of the um, headsets, like Oculus or something. And they have got their left hand. Uh, they must be left-handed, don't you? And look at this. <laughs> All the pictures the wrong way around. That would be Microsoft, wouldn't it? Um, he's holding his left hand up, and simultaneously his hand is appearing on a giant monitor in front of him. But um, whereas his hand is just in, free, in the air, his virtual hand is holding a stylus what looks like a stylus and he's clicking around and touching various um, cartoon-like virtual objects on the screen. It looks like it's um, 
if you can imagine VR created in PowerPoint, it looks a bit like that, if there is such a thing. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, moving on, moving on. One. Like clip art. Um, yeah, yeah uh, this one, that, oh, here, but I'm going to open this one for sure. I remember this. Uh, the next one is from a site called popsci.com, popular science, P-O-P-S-C-I.com. And... Um, the article is um, posted on April um, the 6th, and uh, one thing it does give you when you get to it is a nice convenient pop-up advert, which you have to put away before you can actually read the damn thing. Anyway, the article is entitled Aging in Virtual Reality, written by somebody called Claire Maldarelli. And... Um, this is this is very interesting. We've uh, we've we've read a lot about you know um, old age uh, pensioners and things have been given 3D headsets and they've suddenly uh, rediscovered their youth bouncing up and down in their wheelchairs or whatever. Sorry, sorry, I'm being flippant. Um, a great great way for people um, like um, you know uh, uh, injured veterans at war. Think of people who are whose mobility is limited to actually see VR. But this is a whole different thing. Um, this is an, actually a VR aging suit, and uh, basically you get into this suit, which is a, a complete body suit contraption. In fact, the only thing that seems to be missing is a visor, <laughs> or there maybe there's a thing that looks like a visor, a visor that maybe slips down on them. Yeah, it's flipped up and, on top of her helmet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's basically called the Genworth R70i aging suit. And uh, this is a media preview at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, which is somewhere in America, probably in Jersey. Um, and um, I like the idea of this because you can put a young people, uh, a young person in one of these suits, and their interaction with the suit will enable them to actually feel like they're old. In other words, you know, um, you, you know, a young person who says, yeah, I hope I die before I get old. Where did that line come from? <laughs> um, can sort of actually get in to a suit like this and then change the lyrics to say, oh, looking forward to getting old or something. You can actually experience at any age the feeling of um, being old. The suit will replicate limited motion and, um, uh, you know, um, the, all the various things that we um, sadly um, find ourselves encountering as we reach a certain age. So I, I think that's rather nice. I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want to tell somebody young to prepare for the um, latter half of their life, uh, how better to do it than put them in a suit to get there a bit ahead of time to figure out what it's all going to be about. So I thought, I thought that was quite a nifty idea. Um, I, lo I love different... those. I, I like that idea, and, and uh, you know, thinking about. Um... I've been thinking about this uh, lately of the weeks in the United States with, uh, you know, the violence between, you know, all kinds of different uh, groups oh, okay. of people with police and things like that. And, you know, the, the mm. whole idea of VR as the, as the empathy machine, uh, it would be so interesting to me to, to think of, you know, somehow uh, a response to a, a criminal act to be, you know, put on a VR suit and experience the life of the person upon which you perpetrated a crime. The, the, you know, yeah. would, it seems like that could be very effective. I, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. it's like uh, become, become the victim. They have these crazy schemes over here where um, I, do, you know, I don't think it's a real serious crime, but you know, the idea is you get a light sentence, but you have to go and meet the person you oh, yeah. uh, did, yeah. did the crime and you make peace with them and not only apologize, but sort of talk it through with them and learn the impact that your crime had on them and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. yeah, quite frankly, if somebody's going to go up into somebody in the streets and knife them or let alone shoot them, then yeah, I put them in virtuality and shoot them a hundred times over so they get to know what it feels like and don't, you know, they they will then know exactly what they're inflicting on the other person. Yeah. Um, you know, it seemed to be a you know a, a eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of thing where you use virtual reality. <laughs> um, of course, they won't come away with bleeding stomach, but I mean, you know, sort it's of. It's just a I, concept, I, yeah. And when yeah, I think yeah, of it, that, tactile. tactile wise you know but haptic input and stuff you can be pretty convincing right, right. i would think and and then my follow-up thought to that is the first image that comes to mind is malcolm mcdowell in a clockwork orange with his oh, his God. eyes forced <laughs> open or if we force people into vr is that the same thing you know it's also well yeah <laughs> that's um <laughs> That, I mean, I, I have read at least one novel. I forget which one it was. Um, but um, 
I read it a couple of years ago, I think, when I was reading quite a lot of them. Um, it's, uh, it's actually about a future Britain where um, prisons are literally, uh, when people are sent to prison, they're literally put in, you know, put in seats, force-fed, and uh, sentenced to uh, so many years in VR. Mm. And, oh. uh, and, the, and the VR sentence um, is uh, um, appropriate to the crime. Mm-hmm. Um, both in terms of its length and the ordeals they will have to suffer. Um, it's not like a game, you know, if you, if something's going to happen to you in that scenario, it will happen to you. You can't avoid it kind of thing. And, um, you know, that, but it, there are all sorts of variations on that theme, but um, ba- basically um, somebody hacked into the prison system and um, they were creating all sorts of havoc with the uh, prisoners uh, choosing, um, you know. Uh, it's one of those films. Yeah. It's a yeah. very good book. I'll try and remember what it is and let you know. But, yeah, that'd um, be great. It, yeah. it, it, it was a very good read. And, um, you know, I like all good reads like that. I mean, you're talking about near future and you're talking about something very compelling. I mean, um, what kind of government or scenario would bring something like that, that in as an alternative to kind of prison systems at the moment yeah. um, I don't know and you know it may, it, it's the sort of thing though when you think speculatively about it you can think well you know um, you can keep people got occupied you know you can um, the idea is to teach them a lesson by putting them in um, you know uh, basically exiling them to um, a virtual space totally for um, however long their sentence is going to be yeah and um, they learn lessons. Maybe there'll be good things, bad things. But whether it is, whether it is seen and constructed as something to improve, um, you know, uh, uh, remedial tactics and to to help um, prisoners come to terms with their crimes or whatever, or whether it's seen as a very vindictive thing of oh, just lock them up and strap them into this machine. You know, yeah, yeah. The, the, it's wide open to, to interpretation. You know, one type of government would do it one way, another would do it a completely different way, but would you then over the similar thing? So, yeah, yeah, futurism. <laughs> always, always my favorite topic. <laughs> um, right, um, another link coming up via Flip It, so I'm going to open it. Oh, yes, this was um, Creative Review, or one word, dot co dot uk, um, very popular magazine in the creative industries here um, <clears throat> they feature all the new ads of the week and things um, uh, 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 commercial creative really and um, virtual ads has been a favourite talking point in the ad industry for the last couple of years uh, the title of the piece we want to create VR experiences for decades and um, yeah, they were talking about uh, the New York Times and their recent win at the Cannes Lyon Festival, and um, the um, the displaced, um, which I've seen, which is like photo panorama stuff from the New York Times, and um, yeah, they're basically um, looking at this from. Um, I, I suspect most of their readers. Um, are sort of advertising agency designers, artists, um, or indeed, you know, marketing people and media people. So it's quite a long, uh, comprehensive article from their point of view. And um, oh yes, there's, um, I think I actually posted this when it came out. But um, there's a talk by Chris Milk at TED earlier this year, and uh, they've embedded the video there, which is a montage of VR experiences that oh. Chris Milk was show- showing off in one place, so to speak. Hmm. So, um, quite good, that. Um, <clears throat> CTRL is astonishing proof that VR storytelling is growing up. I better have a look at this one. This one comes from UploadVR.com, U-P-L-O-A-D-V-R.com, and um, CTL, I'm, um, I've got to refresh my memory. Oh, right, CTL, uh, sorry, uh, CTRL, which is like the initials of your control key on the keyboard, basically, um, is... Um, well, the oldest thing to have here is a trailer um, from it. Um, it's from a company called Breaking Forth. Um, apparently, it takes um, uh, a page from the book of Pixar. <laughs> and, um, 
Well, from the introduction here, it sounds like it's for Oculus Rift or HTC Vive or both. Um, I reckon it must be. They don't actually state it at the top of the article, and I'm I'm talking on air at the moment, so I'm not going to read the whole article again. Looks kind of nice and very interesting. There's one rather intriguing picture uh, lower down in the article, which shows this sort of object type. I don't know whether it's a kind of avatar or something, a sort of little ball with a top on it. And then there's these sort of hollowed out balls, very like prim construct things in front of him. And then there are some real big screens at an angle in front of that, which are actually showing real life webcams of um, people in the virtual environment talking to the virtual characters, so to speak. So um, curious whether that is actually encoded as part of the game in inverted commas, or whether that is actually a live connection that you get while you're playing it is, isn't actually, I'm afraid, uh, very clear. But um, it does actually um, it does actually credit the storytelling ability of uh, what these people have done with the game, actually. And, um, you know, as we, we were saying earlier, you know, oh, well, storytelling is hindered by the frame. And um, it sounds like um, this has come up with some... I, I have to watch it, actually, but I haven't got a headset for this kind of stuff. Um, but it sounds like they've um, they've been tackling um, storytelling aspects that aren't quite as linear as one might expect. Right, um, take a look at this video on YouTube. I haven't got a clue what that is, but it's in my feed, so it must be good. Um, second life lessons. Um, this was um, this was actually a post at zd.net, well, the tech press, and um, it's Second Life Lessons code on what Linden Labs is doing differently with its new VR platform. More more little tidbits thrown in from um, Ebi Elba mostly about, um, you know, where Project Santa will be going, which is not at all where Second Life has been, so to speak. Um, a Steam user survey shows that Vive is crushing Oculus. This was a report at digitaltrends.com. Digital trends, or one word. Was that was that the report based on the Steam download data? Um, there's another report coming up from this morning, which will be at the top of my Twitter feed. Actually, I'm just opening this one now. Um, yes, it's a survey by Steam. Yeah. Okay, because the problem there is, and so you should take this with a grain of salt. Of is that this is uh, based on Steam downloads, not based on actual usage. So you can uh. get Oculus Rift games from many other places besides Steam, primarily from the Oculus Rift store. Uh. So if you were an Oculus Rift user, the Oculus Rift store would be the first place you'd go to get games, not necessarily the Steam platform. But if you're an HTC Vive user, Steam is the only place to go and get games. So okay. the statistics are a little skewed there. So this uh, is it's, a, the, it's a good indicator for the growth of interest in Vive if you yeah. track it over time, but it's not a good way to compare the two platforms. Okay, this is it. This is Imagine Kitely Markets, and they're saying that virtual goods have increased in sales by 300% when they're actually talking about just their market. It's deceptive, isn't it? But yeah, okay, fair enough. Well, um, I, there, I, don't think it, I, don't, I don't know if it was pr pr deceptive. Probably somebody just misread the data. Yeah, but no, this was a report from Steam. So, um, And it does say, to be honest, it does say new Steam survey. Um, but, you know, I, I just post these links when they come up. <laughs> they're, 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 all, they're all, you know, f f reading fodder, aren't they? <laughs> Some people have to read everything. <laughs> I, half, half of these ones I actually just scan. You know, I, I probably post it down without really reading it in depth. Right. Um, Rio Olympics opens uh, Virtual Reality Visitor Center. Post, um, I know Maria's covered that too, but this is uh, virtual reality slash news.net. Um, how virtual racing is turning gamers into drivers. Digitaltrends.com. Um, all one word, that. Digitaltrends.com. And um, this, is, <laughs> this is quite interesting. Basically, um, you know, <clears throat> or you want to fly an aeroplane, well, it, it, for several decades, they put you in virtuality into a simulator to learn. They're not going to let you up into one of those expensive flying machines until you know how to pilot it. 
Um, so this isn't new. But on the other hand, people who, um, you know, people, I, I don't know, imagine a kid who did uh, Microsoft uh, Airline Pilots or whatever, a flight simulator, that was what it was called back in the day. You know, if you grew up with that, maybe as a pilot now, because he had an aptitude for it and went on to do the proper thing. Um, so uh, how virtual racing is turning gamers into drivers. I thought everybody on this planet, except for me, did drive anyway, but that's beside the point. Um, right. Um, now, I never know what to believe here. Um, uh, with all our Brexit and everything else going on, I didn't really, I didn't, wasn't actually sure whether we even have a functional government at the moment. But <laughs> the, uh, virtualreality-news.net does report that the UK government is exploring economic opportunities of virtual reality. And um, I can't actually tell you which minister, oh, it's Secretary for State for Culture media and sport john whittingdale i can't actually see him because he's wearing a headset <laughs> which says the foundry all over his face um anyway he was uh, visiting a software company called the foundry and um i'd, uh, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall i mean then the way these mps have <laughs> been so out of touch and you put your headset on and oh yes yes will this help the economy will it oh maybe uh, uh, anyway anyway oh yes and there's a paragraph saying brexit changes nothing had to get that in didn't they um anyway yes it's good to see that um uh some bit of the government still seems to be functioning and taking an interest in VR for um, economic opportunities. Um, no mention, of course, of the fact that um, several of the major startups in VR that are in London are, I think, are relocating uh, to other places in Europe. Um, and even question marks over Google's new headquarters here. <laughs> right. Um, an infographic. Oh, this is from my good bit. Ah, oh, Maria had an infographic on her site. Helsco uses the VR, but I'll let her come to that. Right. Um, Apple, uh, RoadToVR.com uh, reported that Apple had been granted yet another patent for, uh, it was obviously one that was filed some time ago, for high field of view augmented reality display. Uh, it's a particular. Um, a particular system for viewing augmented reality. It's. Um, it's not something you can easily gauge from the diagrams. It's just got little arrows pointing to things and um, the different parts of it and the way they will generate something called high field of view. Um, but um, it does show that Apple is still getting patents in that field, even though they haven't come up with any kind of products in that field yet. Jaguar, that's the motor company, I think, lets you fill Wimbledon with Andy Murray VR experience. Well, Wimbledon finished today. And uh, one of our chats won it, which was very good. Um, well, the men's one, anyway. Um, I was going to flip it, basically. And um, it basically shows all the people sitting around um, enjoying um, Wimbledon with a, a VR headset. There's a bit of a standing joke. Um, we seen it in comedies and things um, here where, you know, um, you pan in the audience, into the audience um, at um, the tennis championship Wimbledon, the on TV or something, and people's heads are just going left, right, left, right. Oh, you yeah. know, it's a bit like it's a bit like I, 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 you know, if I wore, wore a faulty animation here and my head started flipping, uh, well, you know, go from Maria to uh, James to Maria to James at like speed of light. Well, you you watch people, um, you watch people doing that in the audience at Wimbledon but I, I, I was just musing to myself I wonder what their actions would be if they're viewing this in VR <laughs> do they actually just stay looking forward or do they twist their heads around in VR and end up going the wrong way from the way the ball's going anyway it's quite amusing to think of thinking about it but that's just me I'm just being quirky aren't I nitpicking right um, H2L launch their next generation unlimited hand VR haptic controller. Um, it's not just VR headsets that are popular, as most of you know. I mean, um, we've got Leap Motion, but we've also got gloves and all sorts of other haptic devices, and the manufacturers of these things all think they have got a winner on their hands. I must say this couldn't have looks quite nice. It's not a glove. It's something you wear on your lower arm and um, it's called Unlimited Hand and um, it's um, it was shown at Disrupt's Startup Battlefield 
basically um, earlier in the week and um, H2L is the name of the company um, producing it um, <laughs> I'm looking at the GIF video thing here which shows it on his um, lower arm he's holding his two hands together as if he's a cop you know American cop holding a gun um, that um, presumably it figures out what you're doing uh, there's an embedded video about it as well so if you're interested in haptic devices haptic devices you can um, check that out and oddly enough um, I don't know given that it came out this week I don't know where devices are expected to ship in May 2016 well May hmm. 2016 was last month hmm. so <laughs> that <laughs> might be that might be a typo um, but apparently um, uh, they're on Kickstarter too trying to raise uh, $20,000 and uh, the price they'll be charging for these is a very precise 188 US dollars if you're one of the first to hop on to all the one um, where they come up with figures like that I don't know 188 you know why not just make it 190 or 200 never mind never computers. mind computers computers are yeah. default yep. Yeah, the, the whole thing is probably written by a computer for we know. Right, um, a new virtual reality app called Time Looper takes you back in history. This came by Flippit, so I'm going to check where it really goes. This is the um, Associated Press News Archive, apnewsarchive.com, or one word. And, uh, oh, it's in microscopic print. Thank God I can zoom in on the iPad. Right, uh, oh, Oh, well, I'm disappointed with this. This the, the date on this is March the 14th, so I think this may have been a retweet from somebody who, a bit late on these things. Um, okay, Time Looper is the name of the company. Is um, <laughs> imagine what it fr watching frantic shopkeepers busily extinguishing the Great Fire of London or sheltering from Nazi bombing raids during the Blitz. And um, this app that they're working on called Time Looper is designed to do just that, create virtual recreations of moments in history so you can experience those moments in history as if you were really there. Um, I'm very keen on virtual worlds and technology recreating history, so there you go. Um, right, uh, if you were talking of infographics... Um, a, a site called this is retweeted from virtual reality news um, gettopical.com um, slash virtual dash reality um, it's uh, introducing virtual reality startup landscapes and basically it's one of these sort of charts with the logos of all the different companies sort of concocted into a, a sort of order that it makes sense to the publisher basically um, nothing new there but if you like infographics there you go um, art in the virtual world <clears throat> this was a post from Australia at the Australian or one word the Australian dot com dot au and um, it's an article about an artist called uh, um, or an illustrator called Eric Lobiki who is carving art in the virtual world there's an embedded video um, that kind of um, shows you what he's doing. He's been working with Google's Tilt Butch and uh, various different types of um, hand controllers and um, the things he's doing, maybe cartoons or sculpture or something actually practical as designing a dress. And um, not only does he create the art in a 3D environment, but um, he then prints out all the art he creates using a 3D printer. So he's actually making his living so selling um, art he's created in a virtual space and then printed out in a 3D printer and selling in the real world. So a, a nice enterprising bit of art history there, I think. Right, I'm hearing clunk. So, clunk. so the, the answer is yes, they, the real virtual world can help create art for the real one? <laughs> yeah. Another, uh, another uh, question uh, headline. It just... Uh... There is um, actually even talking. Um, I know there was. I think it. No, I don't think it was Second Life. I think there was an Open Sim viewer. Um, uh, Maria may, may remember this. It must be two or three years ago now. And I gather the person working on it is still around. But I think somebody bought the. 
idea of him. But um, it was a very simple viewer, and you couldn't do much with it except log into you know, open some regional stuff. Um, it was never really fully developed as a viewer, but it did have one thing you could do, and that was you could select um, a, a prim or multiple prims and group them together, and you could output to a 3D printer for um, you know from uh, the um, virtual world client. So I would be able to come to this studio, for example, and I could click on all six seats, and I could click on the, the, the booth and the sign behind us, make sure I got everything clicked, and then I could group them all together and print out a 3D model of the um, um, review studios here. Oh, yeah. Um, um, I don't know the animations would be working, but you get the idea. Um, you know, so um, that, and I, I remember when that came out, I thought, oh, that's a great idea. Um, you know, it had tools in the interface for selecting, you know, specifically for selecting components to print. Um, but it didn't really function very well as a, a more general purpose here. But um, uh, interesting, you know, interesting pathway to go on, you know. I mean, most uh, most software has a print command. Um, you know, why shouldn't a virtual world have a print command, especially if there's a way of printing into 3D or printing a... You know, um, maybe we'll be able to print out an app of a virtual experience or something one day. Who knows? Who knows? So um, that's output rather than input, but it's still part of the same great equation. Right. Um, okay. Distance underestimation in virtual environments. This was episode 394 of Voices of VR.com. And. Um, I, I think all of us who use um, OpenSim and similar environments have experienced this. Um, I make great use of it, to be honest, because uh, working in a virtual environment, I can create, you know, I can I can take 12 regions or something and make a, you know, an entire continent out of them because you, it's not really the, the landmass of a continent, but you can use optical illusions and things because you, you can stand in a position and see mountains in a distance and you don't realize that the mountains aren't really in a distance at all until you walk towards them and they're only two minutes away and um, it's, only, it's only a few avatars high that you have to fly to get on top of them you know nothing is quite to the real scale of stuff but anyway this was an interesting talk because it was um, it was talking about you know the way we underestimate or um, m misinterpret um, uh, distance um, when we're using virtual environments. You know, that's interesting because, um, I mean, that's an intentional phenomenon in, in many video games. I know the the Beth mm. Bethesda games, the you know, they create vast landscapes that you walk through, but it's because of tricks of the lens and the rendering engine that, you yeah. know, you can be on the mountaintop in, in, you know, 500 steps, but it looks, yeah. you know, you have the visual experience, so I, I wonder if that takes into account the the intentionality of uh, of world designers to cause that phenomenon. I think it's a bit both. I mean, certainly, yeah. I'm I'm aware of things I can do with distance in um, open sim here, um, in the in the regions downstairs here, um, uh, to create illusions. Other people may not even think that. They may just, um, although they may indirectly think it because they'll build something they think looks okay. And in fact, it's not okay, but it lo looks okay. But I, I just find it helps to, um, you know, to me, it's normally a matter of positioning myself in camera angles and studying things, how they look from the sky, how they look from when you're standing at ground level and how you're, the, you're they're looking at an offset, maybe a bit um, higher up than ground level. And then I reckon if the illusion works at enough different angles, then it is possible. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, you know, if um, if you could, it did have unlimited terrain, you know, the size of a continent, so, you know, you could actually build, you could have, I don't know how many sims it would take, but, uh, regions it would take, but, you know, you could build Everest in, in real scale. But, of course, it would take the Avatar as long to get up Everest in the virtual world as it would in real life, you know, if it was in real scale. So, you know, you... <clears throat> you do play tricks. Um, also, for example, I can have... Um, I can have a wall, for example, which it, 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 it's not really 3D at all. It just looks like it's extending the landscape. It's a full uh, a full wall around a region that is giving you a visual impression of something where there are no regions. But when you collide with that wall, it could actually teleport you out to a skybox, which mimics the region you thought you were walking into. 
So, you know, the, 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 the world is our oyster, but it ain't quite the real world, mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yep. <clears throat> uh, on the plus point, I got um, an IM uh, from a lady called Bettina Tessy during the week. Um, she apparently has just returned and is looking for um, artists and things um, in virtual world. She hasn't been around for a couple of years. Um, but... Um, um, uh, well, she's expressed interest in coming back, and the reason you may remember the name is she was um, she founded a group called MPIRL, Not Possible in Real Life, oh, yeah. and um, back in Second Life, they uh, she put on and curated and fa- and also ran a blog, finding all sorts of quite literally art and things in Second Life that were not possible in real life. So um, I'm uh, she's back in there now. So if you've got anything like that in Second Life, look her up, and I'm going to try and drag her out here as well um, when I can actually get hold of her and um, tell her that not not possible in real life is actually in the hypergrid, where things because the hypergrid has a unique feature. It's called not possible in Second Life. <laughs> you know, as far as I'm concerned, the uh, not possible in real life, that's that's the unique selling proposition for for <laughs> Open Sim <laughs> and Second Life. I love it, yeah. It is, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I'm looking uh, forward to getting in touch with her again. I, I do actually know her in RL, but um, I, I, um, so far I haven't been able to tackle her about getting an avatar over here yet. So, right, um... <clears throat> Where was I? Oh yes, um, VR Tech. Um, virtu- uh, this is a link via Virtuality Dash Newsnet. Um, Adobe study. Adobe, of course, are the people that make um, Director and Photoshop and um, uh, Flash and all that stuff. Um, VR key to tapping into consumer empathy. Uh, this was a study uh, by um, uh, uh, um, Adobe Systems. And it's in a report that the full title seems to be the future of experience. And um, if you if you follow this link at Virtuality Newsnet, there's a link there that will actually take you um, to the report. It was carried out jointly by Adobe Systems and Goldsmiths at the University of London here in the UK. And, um, <clears throat> well... Yeah, it's all connectivity and um, stuff. I mean, Adobe, of course, recently put some VR tools into uh, Premiere, their video editing app. Um, There's not much VR stuff in Photoshop, uh, but again, that's mostly still images. Um, But they they are clearly another one of these bigger companies that's taking an interest in um, in the new medium and... um, studying it accordingly as opposed to bringing out a handful of things that they may not be able to sell right um how virtuality could save planned parenthood um i I did a double take on this one um it it's from the site europe.newsweek.com which is the european edition of newsweek and um i've got a funny feeling this is going to be one of these articles that is going to require me to go through a few thousand adverts before it... Uh, here we are. Here we are. Right. Um, yeah, virtu- um, an organization called Planned Parenthood um, has um, done a virtuality documentary called Across the Line. Uh, the reviewer said he thought it would focus on the many um, hurdles women seeking reproductive health care um, in Mexico <laughs> were um, coming across because uh, of abortion laws and stuff um, but um, actually it's more it's more on the political front um, uh, with um, experiences of um, well imagine <clears throat> imagine you are going to a Planned Parenthood clinic right now uh, Planned Parenthood clinics as I'm quite sure you realise like marriage counselling or whatever uh, they're all over the place. Um, some of them have a stigma in that, um, you know, um, you will see a woman going into them, and some people will presuppose that the reason they're going there is to get an abortion. And in countries like America, where there are lots of fanatical pro life, I think they call themselves, or is it the other way around, people, then um, they can get molested just by going into one of these buildings. And the uh, virtual reality app is actually to d- designed uh, more for the public to give you um, 
to mimic the experience of the um, disconnect between the public outside and you as an individual going in. So you can walk into one of these buildings virtually and experience all the discomfort that you, um, a, a real person, would experience going into a real building from people watching them, and, and that kind of thing. It's not just it's not just that <laughs> incident, but the idea is to um, put you, um, you know, put you into three sixty degrees um, um, things. You know, you see um, visibly shaken patients being comforted by staff and things all recorded or, or more or less photographically in um in 3d so it's um you you, you just it, it's like the dispossessed people thing from New York times it's like the, the idea of being there and um just it, it, giving you a greater feeling of being there than even the best photograph can do and um you know it's wonderful to see in fact not just this but a lot of these apps are being done for socially good reasons you know to put you in the mind and footsteps of displaced people or uh, put you in the mind and footsteps of a woman seeking an abortion and uh, witnessing the way um, they um, are treated um, it's a bit like ses sexism in virtual worlds you know um, any man should get a female avatar and start wandering around for a while um, with sexist males around and you'll soon find out <laughs> that you are not treated the same way as you are when you walk around as a man and probably the other way around too um, so these are really interesting kind of developments that um, show much greater you know, potential use than the, the gimmicky side of um, some VR and yeah. you know the, the games even you know yeah. these are quite, quite serious the empathy engine at work Indeed, indeed. Yeah. My headphones are feeling very slippery today. I, I, they're now coming down the front. <laughs> do, they're do, now falling off the front end of the end of my head. Do, do, do I need to get you some gaffer tape? Would that help? <laughs> um. Uh, no, I don't think so. It's just. Okay. Um, I have no idea why. I think it's uh, one minute I'm looking down at my iPad, the other one I'm looking it up at the screen. Ah, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, um, MIT Technology Review. Uh, it's just technologyreview.com. <clears throat> Oculus Project lets you feel in VR without gloves. Um, this um, is discussing um, various, uh, well, the, the Oculus Project called Haptic Wave. Um, there's no way of knowing at the moment whether Haptic Wave will make its way into a future Oculus product but they're doing um, a lot of um, research and um, this is a, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the photograph of this um, of Haptic Wave an Oculus research project uses a metal plate to let you feel virtual objects and get a sense of where they're coming from and uh, basically, um, it, it, you know those little floating, um, rotating things you find at the bottom of microwave ovens that it goes around when you put your plate in it? Well, it looks well, like, what are those on a table, you know, like uh, 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 as if you had a drawing pad. But, you know, um, the guy's just got his palm of his hand on this plate. And I, I, it's round, so I'm assuming it turns. But I think it. I, I think it also reacts to the distance your hand is above it too. So uh, whether a, sim a simple circular plate like that can actually incorporate up and down haptics as well as circular motion haptics, um, I don't know. But it seems fairly interesting. It's not the most unobtrusive of objects to put on your desk, but I mean, um, it's probably no bigger than the average size laptop. Um, it really is quite a big plate. That's why I um, cited the microwave. <laughs> you probably have a pretty good idea of the size I'm talking about. <clears throat> right. Um, interesting. This is an interesting one here because, as usual at the moment, I don't know what the hell it means for me at all. Uh, this is a site called coindesk.com. Coin as in uh, currency and desk as in uh, the thing you sit down at. Unless, yep. you're in, unless you're in virtual reality. Coindust.com. Evaluating the EU's new definition for virtual currencies. Well, a month ago, this would have applied to Britain. Um, now, I don't know whether it would. But ba mm. <laughs> basically, uh, the EU has finally thrashed out, um, with the aid of a, a law firm in Warsaw, um, has actually thrashed out all the legal... Um, uh, things to do with virtual currencies 
um, as they will be controlled in the member states of the European Union. And um, basically, the proposals um, are European Union wide, and they're aimed at um, uh, combating terror terrorist financing and uh, the larger implications for the blockchain sector. So uh, they've been doing uh, quite a lot of work on this, in the EU. They were probably discussing it for about three or four years <laughs> while we were having an election. I don't know um, whether this would, um, if we are um, in Britain, separated from the EU, this will probably mean very little to us, but it will, uh, given the countries in the European bloc, um, you know, this is like... Um, Legislation like this is a bit like um, when um, you know Europe decided that Microsoft were breaking the law by making Internet Explorer part of their operating system. So the European editions of Microsoft Windows can't have Internet Explorer in, installed um, as part of the operating system. They can still sell it to you or give it to you, but and um, you know, so uh, EU legislation does tend to be pretty tough because um, when it's in place, it's a lot of different states uh, bringing it into play at the same time. So anyway, that is uh, Coindesk.com, and um, it can get, it's got a few links there to uh, for those of you interested in economics and currency markets and stuff like that. Um, right. Oh, and a whole bunch of hyper good business there. Oh, yes. Now, here's the great one. Um, I've actually got this from Cho Yardley, J O Y A R D L E Y dot WordPress dot com, but it's been all over the place. Um, I think I mentioned on last week's show that um, somebody um, had been um, trying to get into Second Life uh, with their consumer Oculus Rift. And despite the fact that Linda Lab had on their front page a picture of the Oculus Rift saying jump in now, uh, the viewer didn't work because the viewer was, uh, uh, Linda Lab's viewer was primed for Oculus Rift back in the days when it was a developer edition, not a consumer edition. Mm. Within, within about a week, Linda Lab rolled out an update to the viewer um, so you could use it with the consumer version of Oculus Rift. But apparently this is so flaky but the news is now Linden Labs removes Oculus Rift Project Viewer and will probably not release another one. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah. if you want to get, if you want to see Second Life in Oculus Rift, good luck. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to use the Control Alt Dell Viewer. I mean, the Control Alt Studio Viewer, um, which means I need to contact that developer to see if he's gonna restart um, work on that viewer. Because he he stopped working on it. Yeah, he's been gone a while. Because yeah. Second Life was going to release their own official viewer, and he's like, well, then they're going to open source it, and then everybody, you know, Firestorm and everyone else will have it. So there's no point in me working on this. Exactly. So yeah. Now there's definitely a point for him to work on this, because. Otherwise, you know, nobody's going to be able to use the Oculus Rift with the existing Second Life platform or OpenSim. So, I, 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 my guess is that they didn't have just forgot about it, and then they updated it so quickly they just made a hell of a mess of it. Apparently, you know, it's like you know, it's like wireframe graphics with colors, <laughs> and you know, the the Oculus bit worked, but the graphics in the Oculus didn't, you know. And I don't know, they've given up on it. So, yeah, good good point. We must it's, um, try yeah, and track, track down the guy from who was doing that and see if he's yeah, that's David David Rowe. I'm gonna that, send him. That, uh, an email now. We mean to do that oh, for a couple of days mm, now and keep mm. get forgetting. Thanks, I, thanks for the reminder. I see. But, yeah, I seem to but, think. But he was... Yeah, it's. I mean, the, there there is definitely issues with using Second Life and Open Sim in a virtual environment. Specifically, the frame rate problem. Yeah. Yep. It's okay on a desktop, because you know we we have patience. We can do stuff. But when the frame rate problem occurs inside a virtual reality viewer, it creates motion sickness. Yeah. Because it makes you look like something's going wrong with your vision, and your body thinks you ate something bad, and maybe you should go throw it up. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so so it's a significant issue, and that's that's a really hard issue to address. Because uh, mm. neither Second Life nor Open Sim were built from the ground up for a super good frame rate. Um, I mean, they were built for a desktop user environment 
And the idea was, well, if you have a fast enough computer, it'll be, you know, it'll be okay. And we'll just trust that it works. But it doesn't really matter to deliver a consistent frame rate because, you know, it's, it's a window on a desktop. It d doesn't really matter in any significant way to anybody. With the, with the viewers, it'll make you throw up. So it wow. matters quite a bit. Um, I mean, everything else you can pretty much deal with. The navigation, the movement, the menus. I mean, those are all problematic, but they can all be fixed in the interface. But the frame rate problem is, is core to, to the server, and that's a much, much deeper mm -hmm. issue. So it makes sense for them to say, you know, forget it. Uh, we're just going to work on Sansar. This is too hard. This is too much work. Uh, no point in doing it for a dead-end platform. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't bode well for the, you know, Second Life version 1, as we know and love it right now. And, and mm -hmm. it certainly doesn't bode well for OpenSim because there is no second version of OpenSim out there. Um, and uh, unless the OpenSim community steps up and does something about it, we've got a dead-end platform on our hands, guys. Yeah, um, I agree. You know, uh, this this comes back to, the, you know, the, uh, because this is part of the same equation I was talking about the oh, a few weeks ago about my idea for a lightweight viewer that would be a viewer that you couldn't do anything with. It would be like video. You'd your arrow keys would do movement and camera, and you would you know you'd you'd have a very fast, simplistic um, rendering engine, but you wouldn't have um, you know an inventory or an avatar presence or anything like that. Because if that if something like that could be a link thing that people could get to on the web, might even work on the web. <laughs> Um, and was lightweight, then you could emphasize the things like visual fidelity. And I remember David Rowe, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I don't think he did. I think I had hoped he was going to be on my Open Sim uh, conference panel, and he couldn't. But um, we, of course, had the people there who are actually uh, streaming uh, Firestorm or Second Life clients via video. Um, which means you can go into Second Life or whatever on a, a, a fairly low spec laptop, for example. Um, now you, you pay because you're actually launching an instance of the viewer in the cloud. But um, there's nothing to say that you couldn't have, um, as well as um, Second Life Viewer or Firestorm, um, a an Oculus optimized, uh, you know, a 3D optimized viewer also running in the cloud. That you do still use um, your 3D headset to view, so you would have a much. And obviously, if it's coming down the line like video from the cloud, you would be able to achieve those frame rates with a bit of tweaking. You mm -hmm. know, so if something like that could be figured out, um, it wouldn't be the same as any of the desktop viewers we use at the moment. But I don't know if we are necessarily in a dead end. It just means a bit of um, uh, lateral thinking, <laughs> you know, to to find a way we can bring the worlds we love into into the the, the the headset era, even though it won't necessarily be through the views we got at the moment, or even right. transport. Yeah, and we and you and I have been talking about lightweight web viewer for a really long time. Yeah, and with Google uh, Web VR. It's now possible to have a web viewer that also doubles as a virtual reality viewer yeah. um, by switching it into virtual reality mode. So this is something that's definitely beginning to be doable right now without any plugins natively inside the browser, or at least yeah. the Chrome browser and other you know modern browsers. I don't know yeah. about Internet Explorer. <laughs> um, well, uh, who? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, so it's definitely doable. But uh, everybody who's tried their hand on it so far has made no progress. And the last two teams that I've heard have been working on it, they've seemed to have fallen off the face of the earth. I haven't heard of any progress in it. Uh, I've been trying to contact them. I've been getting no response. Um, so it's, it's really, um, uh, it really makes me sad about the future of this. Everyone is so excited about virtual reality. Um, and, and I think that there's a, that, that there's something called uh, the innovator's dilemma. Have you heard about this from the dot-com boom? Sure. So, so the basic idea of it is that perfectly reasonable people making perfectly reasonable decisions can destroy their companies overnight <laughs> by 
by uh, ignoring the reality of of technologies that will yeah. disrupt their industry. Yeah. And the example that the book used was hard drives. So you have like a big expensive hard drive that all the big companies use that costs a lot of money and somebody shows up with a dinky small cheap hard drive that's not good enough for anybody. And the, the buyers of the expensive big hard drives say, oh no, we don't want that small dinky one. It's, it's lousy. And the manufacturers of the big hard drives say, it's not worth our effort to get into these dinky little things because they mm. cost so little and will cost us more to make them than we can sell them for. Plus, you know, if we do, if we do a good job with them, they'll destroy our primary business, which yeah. just makes a, us a lot of money. And now and we've got so, USB sticks. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so and, and, and the book tracked like five generations of disk drives at which all the previous manufacturers went out of business. Yeah. And, and so during the dot-com boom, everybody was reading this book because it was exactly what was happening because of the dot-com transformation. And we saw this happening with the mobile thing too. The existing mm. game developers ignored the mobile space because mobile games were dinky and dumb and nobody played them and there was no money in them. And next mm. thing you know, there's an Angry Birds movie out there <laughs> And there are giant studios making, you know, billions off of these mobile games, and the existing players totally ignored the market. And by the time they caught on that there was something going on, it was really too late for them to to do anything significant in it. Mm. And so now um, the same thing is, is going to be happening with virtual reality. Right now, there's no money. The platform's too dinky. The mobile VR is too cheap. The tethered VR is too expensive. Nobody's using it. Everybody's interested in it, but there's no money in it. Uh, so nobody pays attention to it. Plus, the customers of the existing platforms don't want it. There's mm. a lot of people using OpenSim and Second Life who are happy with it the way it is. That's why they're using it, because yeah. they're happy with it. And they've got fingers in the ears going na 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 about the virtual reality stuff because mm. they don't feel it's for them. They're happy enough with a desktop-based system. It's, and, it, it, and, it's, it's just the future. You know, people... Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm happy with OpenSIM, working on the desktop with it. Um, you know, I, if necessary, I can actually send the screen by Wi-Fi to my iPad and work on the iPad in it. It's not, you know, it's coming via Wi-Fi and it's a bit slow, but, you know, you can do things like that. I don't want, necessarily want it, you know, I'm not, I'm not like to get a headset and want it that way. I'm sort of, you know, quite happy if it, as it is. If something phenomenally better comes along, I'll probably take an interest in that too, but I won't necessarily give up, you know, what I like, you know, what I've invested a lot right. of time in. But, you know, there, there is always a danger, you know, um, of not keeping your eyes open to see what the trends are. I mean, um, you know, we went through decades of uh, literally the technology for electric cars was suppressed. It was certainly in Britain, right? <laughs> then suddenly environmental things are a concern and you've got like the Tesla cars and things like that now, which are all electric. And you've got radio ads now in the last couple of months um, advertising that, you know, you can travel anywhere in the country and you can charge your electric car, you know. Um, every st gas station's got it kind of thing. And I've never understood you know, you take the big vested petroleum car industry and so many of them have been advertising what they call hybrid cars. In other words, well, it's a bit the old way, so we can still sell you petrol, but it's a bit the other way, so you can charge it. Right, and what the hell? Either make a get rid of the gas thing or make an electric one, you know, and I, I think as soon as electric ones are everywhere, the, 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 the people that have been manufacturing the so-called hybrids, you know, they're, you know, they're the putting themselves out of business because, you know, the, the cost point in investing in electric at the moment is higher than the gasoline thing, but at the same time, it's no higher than the so-called hybrids. If you right. see what I mean, well, yeah, uh, it just seems a, daft, it, you know. It's not... a transitional technology, you yeah. know, and and we have those, and then those are a short-term business. Yes. Yeah. Um. Now, right now, right now, in in virtual reality, if you were to use a viewer with OpenSim, you would have the motion sickness problems, you would have the interface problems, 
Mm-hmm. And I can definitely see why somebody would say, well, this is dumb. Why would anybody want this? It makes you sick. Um, mm-hmm. It's not as good as doing it on the, on the desktop. Um, kind of like the way when Windows first came out with the mouse and it didn't have all the functionality of the DOS commands that you had before. And um, it was slower than typing in the commands, especially for people who knew them, the control codes and stuff. And so people were like, why would you want this? This is really stupid. The well, mouse, the mouse. If you, the really mouse... Want, if you really wanted one, you bought a Mac where the mouse would. Yeah. But, but, but the point that I'm making is that there were originally a certain point of people who didn't want the new thing. And yeah, uh, but but Microsoft saw where the wind was blowing and switched over anyway. I think that was the one time in existence when Microsoft saw the way the wind was blowing and got there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was such an obvious, uh, an obvious addition. To use it. you know, well, yeah, it was, it was a... not obvious at the time. The users did not want it. It <laughs> was really not obvious. I talked to a lot of people who said this looks like a toy. I'm never going to use it. Uh, adults are going to want to use it. It's too slow. It's too inconvenient. It, you can't do the stuff you can do with DOS in it. Because um, <laughs> they've already spent all the time learning all those DOS commands. So they were really oh, yeah. good fast at that. And, and the mouse was really, really slow. And it looked really stupid. It looked like a game. People did not want to use it. But over time, it improved. It got better. Everyone switched over. Microsoft could see the future ahead of time and yeah. made that transition. Now, we're having the same situation right now where the manufacturers and the developers have to get out ahead of the users and say, we know what's good for you. We know you're going to want the virtual reality. We're going to invest in it anyway. And in OpenSim, that is not happening right now. And in in Second Mm -hmm. Life with Sansar, I have no idea what they're going with there. It, It makes very little commercial sense right now. The people who are rolling out the platforms are Altspace and VTime with building their platforms from the ground up virtual reality. They work on mobile headsets. They're social VR. They're already there. They're already attracting users. And um, all they need to do is start, you know, selling and renting spaces and having in-world building tools. And we're we're going to get to a situation where they are building the next infrastructure mm. and then somebody comes out, reverse engineers it, and does an open source uh, thing that's based around what's going on over in that space as opposed to what's going on over here in the open sim space. Mm. And I think that the fact that we don't have a big company um, involved with open sim development, somebody like Red Hat Linux, the way they're involved with Linux, or the way that WordPress has um, uh, the company that's behind WordPress, whose name I can't remember right now, they they can make a decision and say, we're going to make an investment and push ahead to the future, and there is nobody in OpenSIM who can make that decision. Unless somebody comes in with, out of left field with investment funding and says, okay, we're going to build on top of OpenSIM, and we're going to push it forward. Um, the current infrastructure as we have it now doesn't have a lot of potential for long-term development. And that really scares me because uh, I love OpenSim and I think that having an open source peer-to-peer metaverse is the best thing ever. I, I, tend, to, I tend to agree. I mean, I, I love OpenSim and I actually love it the way it is, of course. But, you know, uh, yeah, uh, all it would take is something that takes everything that's good about OpenSim, the hypergrid and, and Second Life type Installations and come up with something that is, you know, got all that stuff but better and works in VR2 or something. Yeah, we, you know, it's a matter of holding on, keeping on the new things, but, you know, the, the um, you know, I, I, I always look out for the idea of, you know, be, you know, because, um, OpenSim and Second Life, even as they are at the moment, including in worlds and other things, are. Increasingly, you know, they increasingly get better and better in some ways, but they do. They are on a path where they're going to look dated quicker than the hardware expectations that are taking off. Um, I don't mind that because I'm used to it, but I mean, I have to say that will, you know, um, be a niche. I think the things that 
it offers at the moment um, aren't available anywhere else and that is that is the key but there will be a point when it, it where it, what it offers may be offered elsewhere and we will look dated i don't know i mean uh, but i've still got faith it's going somewhere but i agree with you it would be nice um although i like open source and you know everything open i mean it would be nice if some commercial operator you know came into the open sim space and just revamped it completely and gave the you know swapped the code back in return for you know i don't know uh, they 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 run with some aspect of it maybe or something but um we'll 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 kind of have to wait and see really it's um i haven't lost faith yet in fact i'm thoroughly enjoying myself (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand uh, or this show and all my news feeds and stuff like that is all about looking at what the future and what's coming um, rather than sitting back complacently and thinking oh let me get another island let me get another region <laughs> uh, it will it will stop somewhere <coughs> we'll see even the broadcasting side of it you know I've got to look at what will be um, more acceptable maybe in the future we'll have to see and of course there's high fidelity as well which is <clears throat> moving in into other areas too that include both the headsets and on screen things so yeah Okay, well, we'll come back to that. I think it's an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, Back on my news, July 6th, um, a company called La Forge, right? And I think this is... Well, they're launching La Forge Optical. Um, They're an eyewear company, and I guess really they're a fashion company. Uh, There's a photo on this site. It's a VR Scout, or one word, dot com. And the title is La Four Chains to Ship Stylish AR Glasses uh, Late 2016. You know, it was pretty pretty near future. They have a very Jerry Hawley looking hairstyle on a model, and she's wearing just <clears throat> a pair of what would be you would just think ordinary glasses. Mm-hmm. Shima's digital eyewear. Um, so simple they just look like normal glasses what i'm always going on about now i should hasten to add that this uh these are not virtual reality they are augmented reality but it seems that they can come up with something like this that features augmented reality then it can't they you know (laughs) why do we need to have to go to huge headsets to make something for virtual reality well processing i know and stuff but yeah um they look very nifty um, there's an embedded video from uh, Vimeo there um, showing them being worn. Um, <clears throat> originally called ISIS and renamed Shima, the glasses reportedly can frame the person's field of view with a user face depicting various ways to snap photos, post online, play music, also show bits of useful information that can be streamed in subtly, uh, minima- minimally described as a heads up display as well. And um, there's also a little photo of how the interface looks as you're looking through the glasses. You're just seeing like, um, well, it looks slightly tinted, like you're watching through sunglasses, but very, well, until the advertising starts, reasonably unimposing overlays. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, yes, nice um, nice little pair of glasses. You know, they, they're they not your normal pair of glasses, as they say, but they damn well look like them. So, you know, um, I, could, I could go with those, um, basically. Um, very convenient-looking things to wander around in, I think. Oh, and they are... Um, yeah, they, um, they can be made for um, as prescription glasses as well. So... They're not. Um, they're just not like a um, a, a gadget that um, has a dumb lens kind of thing. Okay, uh, so that was VRScout.com. That article. Um, Voices of VR number three ninety six. This was called "Sequenced and the Challenge of Interactive VR Narratives." We're back to storing here, storytelling here again. Very interesting. Um, I, I, I didn't like the way people are actually really focusing on how on earth, you know, there's videos, there's articles galore. How on earth are we going to tell stories in VR? Uh, but I'm, it's, it's good that so much attention has been paid to that because it will be crucial, I think, um, as well as the uh, social VR context. Um, liveness in the virtual world. Right, this um, this is a post at 
music at Cambridge, as in the university, or one word, dot wordpress.com. It's called Liveness in a Virtual World. It's referring to live music. And it's about, um, it's really geared at uh, people wanting to perform live music in virtual spaces. Um, quite an interesting article there. Um, elementary in some ways, but probably if um, particular used to musicians who want to um, play online in front of a virtual audience. Um, also, um, via Flipit, I'll open this one. Um, Analytics Twitter. Oh no, sorry. This says a. This is at Telegraph.co.uk, and it's um, the article is called Inside Tension VR, the UK's first virtual reality centre, and it's not actually in London. It's uh, somewhere out in the sticks. So forget about it. <laughs> sorry, no. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, that, but I'm. I, I hate to admit it, but oh, come on, Ava, go away. Right. Um, I hate to admit it, but that will be the attitude of a lot of people, I think, because the, the tech things do tend to be something. This is actually. Um, it's an adapted. It's a former church in a town called Lincoln. It's a fairly big town. It's got a county around it called Lincolnshire. So you know, it's Lincoln, Lincolnshire. Um, but anyway, it's. Um, um, a project called Tension VR, and the idea is you can go in there and um, you know work with Oculus Rifts and um, various other stuff, HTC, and um, and they've got an upstairs area which has got big graphical walls teasing some of the VR experiences available, um, um, as well as some from non-VR games like Overwatch. So. Um, Anyway, nice to see. I mean, you know, just think you live in Lincoln and you're walking down the high street and you pass this old church, which is a strange new building <laughs> called Tension VR. And you are, what's in there, you say? Right. Um, oh, Maria, uh, I, Maria tweeted this. I don't think it, it, right, it was an article of CNET. I thought it was rather funny. Virtual reality, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find that at cnet.com and Miriam may have something to say about that it's not a hyper good business thing though um, VR Index uh, there's a Twitter account called at the VR Index with VR in capitals and um, Virtuality Venture Capital Alliance VR VCA a top of companies in one place um, this is basically if uh, this is really just a business. If you're interested, oh, well, maybe maybe somebody will have an idea for open, bringing open sim into virtuality and doing a viewer. Um, the, actually, I'm just going to open this. Um, if you if you are an entrepreneur and have ideas for this and you want funding, venture capital, VC funding. Uh, the purpose of the Virtual Reality Capital Alliance is to foster long-term growth in the VR industry through identifying, sharing, and investing in the world's most innovative and impactful VR technology and content companies. And um, it, this is um, this is not one company or one group of venture capitalists. It's like a, an umbrella organization of venture capitalists that um, um, are getting together to promote this sort of um, place you can go to if your interest is VR and I've got so many adverts popping up on this one that's all I'm going to say for now, I can't really read it <laughs> yes, I <laughs> don't know about you I was getting adverts all over the place there right um, uh, Virtuality is up in China at VentureBeat, Maria retweeted that as well so I'll leave that to her um, oh and also Maria uh, uh, right, um I don't know where you'll cover this, Maria, because it's something I retweeted from your own account rather than Hyper Good Business. But uh, you tweeted a post. Um, there have been quite a few posts about this, actually. But you posted to Rolling. You tweeted one from RollingStone.com about the brothers behind Mist have reunited to create a mysterious new VR world. I love it. I mean, I haven't tried it. <laughs> I figured. I, have, yeah. I haven't. I haven't <laughs> tried it, but I've seen photographs galore. It feels like something that is missed. And um, apparently it works with headsets and stuff like that, although the, the, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be a normal version. It just looks delicious. I can't wait to get my hands on that. Um, <laughs> um, 
you know, um, uh, but I'm a huge Miss fan. It's the only game. Well, it's a puzzle more than the game, but the only thing I could... Uh, well, it's, I think, the only thing I ever had that didn't shoot me down in the first frame. Um, <laughs> you know, and I can't, I, you know, I can't get in it, into any game that shoots at me. <laughs> <laughs> However hard I try, I'm just, my reflexes aren't built that way. So, um, Mist was a joy to behold, and it's sequels and everything else. Well, and I, I love the literary sort of aspect to it as well. Okay, how VR video is being used to help kids conquer their fear of swimming. This was supposed to road to VR.com. I'm not going to open it, it's just another use case. But apparently, um, some kids are afraid to get in the water. But then you put then you put a headset on them and you put them in the water and they suddenly decide it's cool to go in the real water. I hope they don't dive into the real water while they're still wearing their headset. <laughs> <laughs> um but um, oh, so that uh, would be really cool. Yeah. I, 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 well, the first time I thought it, you know, could you, you just imagine some kids sort of getting carried away, jumping into the water with their headset on, and sparks will fly as <laughs> the cables, <laughs> the tethered cables blow up or something. Well, you do it with a mobile set, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the new yeah. sets are waterproof, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but anyway. yes, yes. I mean, you know, when I first read that, I did sort of think kids, and then I thought swimming. And you know, would I trust a kid to wear a VR helmet and remember to take it off before they actually got in? But anyway, I guess the idea is their fear. Maybe then, when they've overcome their fear, where you just take the headset away, of course. Right. Um, uh, Maria reports on their school's outage. Um, <clears throat> Virtual reality really is heading to a university near you. That's a post five flip it. I'm not opening it. Um, it's um, that was uh, last night's feed, I think. Um, VR um, VR covers next project is going to be a VR fitness experience. Another link via um, uh, um, flip it. Uh, the project is called VR Cover, and um, the, the one thing I did like about this is the photograph, because it shows you the um, headset not from the outside in, uh, from the outside, but from the inside. And it, this one is so nicely cushioned. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, do, I imagine my eyeballs would be sweating, but it's all cushioned and really, lo- you know, you know how we look at VR helmets. And we think, you know, this is tech. You know, sure they're a bit cushioned around the eyes, but you know, the whole look of them is kind of very constructed you know <laughs> this actually looks like a cushion it just looks really comfortable from the inside view um which may go a long way to convincing skeptics like me that i actually will wear one from now and again right um oh here's a new one mind and terror <laughs> um this is a post at the vrindex.com and it's, it's really just an announcement it's not a post um, but um, uh, it's advertising a network for people in the virtual reality and augmented reality in, um, um, industry. And um, the uh, website is mindandterror.com. And terror, as, is, as in the word for Earth, T E R R A. So it's mindandterror.com, or one word. And they, they're actually called mind and terror so um, if you're interested in getting in touch with people working in our field so to speak um, there may be um, something good happening there or there may not be I don't know um, right um, now there, this is one that I know Marie is um, always mentioning when we're talking about headsets I've actually got their app but it doesn't really it's um, USA prices only they don't seem to have a, 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 a decent um, UK set up Alibaba Alibaba will let consumers shop shop the world's stores via virtual reality. Um, It's a piece of the site called Get Topical, two T's, Get Topical, or one word, dot com. And, um, yeah, they're basically like like an eBay kind of um, setup, but apparently, you know, they they want to enable VR for all the stores online. So, you know, you go to, like, you go to eBay and you go to, I don't know, Fred's Videos, um, and um, you look at it, you know, you see his list of stuff. Well, apparently Alibaba want you to be able to go into the store in 3D, in virtual reality, and pick and choose what you want from the store. Um, which uh, shopping in VR is bound to come, isn't it? Really, right? Is there, 
the, this site is mostly used, um, the English language version on the site at least, mm -hmm. is mostly used for, uh, for distributors buying Chinese products in bulk. Yeah. So if you want to buy like 500,000 units of a virtual reality headset, you would go on Alibaba and you can get them really cheap. Um, and you can get them customized and you know everything else. Um, if you want to buy individual ones, uh, the site to use is AliExpress, and that's uh. where I actually buy most of my well, many of my headsets. I also I'm... use Gear um, uh, Gearbest. Uh, both are Chinese sites, and both um, often have free delivery to U.S. customers. And um, I've had no zero problems, and I've ordered a lot of headsets from them, and I've had zero problems with getting uh, stuff delivered to me very quickly. Yeah, I think uh, it's Ali Express I was thinking of actually because, um, but I, I don't know. But in Britain, basically everything's for sale in dollars, and um, most of it's got long shipping times. You know, was where it's going from China or America, I don't know, but it's not going to be in the post the next day kind of thing. Uh, but that's from that's from a UK perspective. I know they are used a lot. Um, they they keep sending me there. Hey, you've got to come to Alibaba. Here are summer offers. Hmm. Yep. And tomorrow is summer's offers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, anyway, yeah. Um, how should we move around in virtual reality? Nobody's figured it out yet, apparently. We read all about that at a site called digitaltrends.com. Digital, uh, digital trends, T R E N D S, all one word, digitaltrends.com. Um, virtual reality Chinu created to help train medicus in the UK armed forces. Um, they basically built the inside of a Chinook helicopter um, in virtual reality and um, they're putting medics into the uh, virtual reality Chinook helicopter to train them so that when they get into a real Chinook and get shot down over some foreign place we're not meant to be they will know how to treat people <laughs> military are always big on these things right um Another post from the Epic VR channel, whatever that was, I retweeted it. Um, it's a post at slashgear.com, and um, they too say Oculus is losing the VR war. Bleak outlook ahead. Um, so that's at slashgear.com, and that's actually, I think, is. Um, oh, I'll open it quickly. Um, I think that is separate from the um, Steam um, report that um, we, we mentioned earlier on. Um, yeah, it, I, it, mm. I, I uh, thought it was based on the Steam report. I'm, I've just opened it to have a quick look now, and I think um, the, the other one was um, from uh, earlier on, but this was supposed today. And um, yeah, they cite Steam. Steam. They do. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair and, enough. And, and they and they and they don't understand how how the Oculus works. They say it's possible that there are a few Rift owners that don't use Steam. Most oh. Rift owners go to the Oculus Rift store to get their apps. <laughs> so. So there um, we. Okay, I didn't see the citation for the the Steam report, yeah. but um, if yeah. it's there, I, I can assume it is there. They're probably rehashing the same article and rewriting exactly. it that way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The usual stuff. You're a journalist. You know how that works. <laughs> That's why I try to go to the original source whenever I see one of these articles and I and I write yeah. it up. Yeah. I, I try to trace it back to the original announcement or original report. Otherwise, it turns into a game of broken telephone, where you know you don't know what's I, going on. Yeah, I know the feeling. I, I, I usually try and get originals because, you know, I'm constantly monitoring, you know, and I, I tend to tweet the first instance of something, even if it's a version of a press release. And if I see the same thing again, I don't. But, you, you know, sometimes the interpretation will come out before the real thing and then you're in a pickle. <laughs> right, uh, the last thing for me is um, a site called edgesurge.com, E-D-S-U-R-G-E.com. And it's a review. It says, we tried lifelike to explore what edu educational VR content actually looks like. Now, the spelling of lifelike is L-I-F-E-L-I-Q-E. -E. Um, basically, uh, it's an immersive um, VR app. 
um, which displays 3D models of natural phenomena on tablets in augmented reality and in virtual reality. And um, I'm just... Um, its focus is obviously education. I'm just... Um, it says on tablets... Um, yeah, so I don't think the um, Google Cardboard is um, or a headset is a prerequisite here. Although the uh, the viewer actually did um, view something in the Vive headset as well, so it looks like they've got most of most of the points covered. But it certainly looks to me like there's a desktop um, version or a tablet version of this. I have not found it to download it yet. Um, if it's on the iOS system, and um, looks like. Mm, looks like it's going to be a subscri it's subscription service as well, but um, you know you, you can tell it's geared to educators because the, the the photograph at the top of the article is a good old dinosaur. <laughs> yep, history, history lesson. Here we come. <laughs> right. Well, I, I won't comment on educational. But I won't con con I won't comment on educational institutions as dinosaurs. But they, <laughs> no, they've hit their demographic head on right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dinosaurs. Well, yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Okay, okay. Well, having done all that, I can actually hand over to Maria. For I mean, Maria has plenty of news for you. It just wasn't hypergrid news. So let's, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, oh, can I, can I, can I butt something in? It sure. wasn't, it wasn't in my feed, and it's not in Slack either. I thought I posted this somewhere. Right, but um problems with VR headsets yeah <laughs> fascinating article this week <laughs> women are becoming loath to wear VR headsets because it messes up their makeup mm. <sighs> I thought you were going to say hair but okay no no makeup okay <laughs> it comes I, off I, <laughs> oh, sorry I had, to, I had to get that one in <laughs> it's not not so much that the headset messes up their makeup as the makeup messes up the headset quite <laughs> yeah because it because it comes off on the headset on the yeah. spongy material and that's kind of gross mm -hmm. yeah I bet it is yeah and then so, you and then you hand it to somebody else to wear and oh <laughs> what, what's all this <laughs> yeah. So, um, so uh, I I think that um, women who wear makeup and who use headsets are are in people who uh, show off headsets uh, in a public place like uh, arcades and roller coasters. There's definitely a market for disposable headset covers. Because it's not just makeup you don't want to have on your headset. It's other people's sweat, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? well, it was germs. It's a health and safety yeah. issue. I think makeup, that, that the makeup works. is just a visible thing, but you, mm. you, know, you, get, you get sweat as well. Um, and so there's definitely a market for, I think, disposable covers or headsets with wipeable foam, one or the other. So you can have a little baby wipe and you wipe them off uh, between people. Um, or or you have uh, re a removable cover that you can just throw away. So mm. I think that one of those things are good. Now this is a short-term problem as we move to an eyeglass kind of setup. Oh, um, yeah. I think mm -hmm. that the problem will go away since the points of contact it's around the face are going to be very little, if if not almost none. Yeah. So and, and also they're made of plastic, so they're much easier to wipe off too. You, you're not going to need the soft padding if it's a lightweight eyeglass type shape. Yeah, true, sure. Yep. Not not so wear makeup, makeup, but it's another reason I want eyeglasses. Because <laughs> <laughs> you could not, because then you would be able to wear makeup if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they just rest on your nose and ears, and you don't normally wear makeup there. Well, their nose maybe, but mm, don't know. Anyway, I, I thought it was a nice little anecdote to throw in before throwing it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, again, lots of news going on. I didn't even mention the $10 billion VR investment fund that HTC has launched with a bunch of investors. Mm -hmm. They're really doubling down on their VR operation, especially because their mobile operation isn't going uh, that great. Um, 
And also in another uh, un- re- kind of unrelated news that I didn't post, uh, Samsung reported very high profits. Um, and I, I don't know if that's just due to the regular thing or due to the halo effect of the fact that they've got this headset that's unique, um, that's included free with their, with their phones, that, that it's getting all this publicity. They're getting so much free publicity for the Gear VR, this, for the Samsung phones. I mean, it's, it's everywhere around the planet. Like I mentioned, uh, my, my freelancer in Nairobi um, uh, went into local stores and they had the Gear VR headsets on display there for people to try. So um, definitely it's, it's extremely, uh, it's an extremely global hey, phenomenon. There, yeah. um, I forget which it is, but um, one of your American TV shows, it's got a very old title. I, I know it because I've heard it. Conan, read. Conan? That's it, giving, yes. Yeah, yeah, he's giving away, that's another thing that I didn't mention. Yeah, he's giving away free uh, cardboard sets again. Uh, he gave away some last year because he's going to have some 360-degree uh, videos coming out this summer. And I have signed up for my cardboard because obviously I don't have enough VR headsets. Yeah. And I have to take them away from people who don't have any. Yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really, you really, des- you're really desperate. You need to get one of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, and also, Sony announced um, uh, an updated earnings forecast. It's more optimistic because they said that their early projections for PlayStation VR are so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, better than they expected. So, uh, and uh, uh, a survey that we just posted today, I think I think you mentioned it earlier, four out of 10 people under 35 have a keen interest in virtual reality, according to a global survey of internet users. So mm-hmm. if you think how many people that is, how, you know, how many internet users there are globally, which is pretty much, at this point, all of us, um, uh, no, no matter where you go on the planet, you can get to, you know, worst case scenario, an internet cafe or neighbors go down the street's going to have a smartphone. Um, mm. Four out of five people is an extremely large amount. It is. Uh, mm. And uh, even for the oldest age group, um, the, the 50s and 60s, uh, they report a 20% interest. So that's also, um, it's not bad, you know. Mm. Because the, these are guys who might who might not be interested in it. Uh, there's a total of um, uh, in 2015 there were three billion uh, internet users on the planet. So did this um, this did the, this indicate? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I I would guess that the interest is generated by accessible things like cardboard. Um, in in terms of that four out of five, uh, rather than um, interest in the high end systems, was there any indication of that in the um, uh, figures? Not not from the survey, but from other surveys we've seen, um, the interest seems to be sparked by all the media coverage of the Oculus and the and the Vive. Oh, right. yeah, but the buying is it tends to be what's most accessible, which is the mobile based headsets. Yeah. So so they get interested in it from like all the news about what's going on and they go to the local stores and they try on the headsets and they're like, Well, all I'm gonna do is, you know, watch videos on this. So mm. this is pretty good. You know, I'm gonna go traveling to the Eiffel Tower. Um which speaking of the Eiffel Tower, um there, there's a there's an app called Street View VR for the Gear VR that I tested out this week, um, and I have to mention this app because it's just so cool and so much better than Google's own Street View app for uh, the Android and iOS. Huh. In the Gear VR app, it's fully virtual. You load it up without taking off your headset. You're in the app. You know you look at the microphone button. You say Eiffel Tower. And you're teleported to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Oh, wow, you, that's you, awesome. You look, you look at the map, and you get a global map. You can zoom in to any parts of it. You can see the popular destinations, or you can zoom into anything else you want. You can see where your friends are. Look at it, and you're there. If and, you, in- and you control it all by voice. You control it with voice, by Perfect. looking, and by tapping on the little trackpad and, and thing. 
Um, you don't have to take, you never have to take it off to do anything with it. It's, it's fully inside this environment, very easy to use, very intuitive. And then if you're in street view, you're standing like in your, in the Google car, looking around at the streets, you look ahead and you jump to the next place where the photograph was taken and you can like move along the street view streets and explore a city. And then you, you look around and you're there and it's, it's it's the I mean it's really compelling. If you have a Gear VR, definitely uh, check this app out. If you're into virtual travel, this app goes underwater to the coral reefs. It goes oh, yes, so, so, it yeah. goes inside to the museums to a whole bunch of places. Um, it has viewer uploaded photographs. It is it's just an amazing amazing application with a wonderful interface. And I do hope that Google will copy it for their own app or, you know, be inspired by it for their own app. For Daydream, because yeah. with the Because with the Google app, you have to keep taking the phone in and out of the headset to switch locations and stuff like that. Mm. Or cut a hole in so, your headset to put your finger on the screen. <laughs> you know, you, you well, can uh, use voice side headset, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, these things are phones usually, so using voice is just so obvious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is, it's a very, very nice setup. I was surprised by how well it worked. I was really surprised and, and very, very impressed because a lot of these apps are like really early iterations mm. and you think that the potential would be great, but when you actually try it out, it doesn't work. Yeah. With this particular app, they really, they really did an excellent job and that is what a virtual travel app should look like. Um, very, very impressed. All right. So uh, we talked about the high fidelity marketplace last week, um, and then the uh, uh, man. Yeah. And the, did we talk about virtual memory palaces? Yeah. Oh, we talked about that. Okay. Um, and uh, you already mentioned the healthcare infographic. Um, so, so these guys sent me this infographic uh, about healthcare uses of VR, which is a nice little poster. Um, so if you want a little poster to put up somewhere for some reason whatsoever, uh, there's a little infographic. It's really pretty. Um, hard to read on a website because it's a, one of those really long infographics, right? Mm. But they also gave me a little article to go with it um, that talks about some of the – a couple of the highlights of, of virtual reality uh, in medicine. Um, so if you're into that kind of thing – and speaking of virtual reality medicine – um, there's a, a new app that helps uh, patients re relax in waiting rooms, and it's basically just a, med a meditation app. Um, and they're giving away these, these headsets, um, and uh, they're also giving them headsets to take home, which is co pretty cool. It can promote uh, the doctor's office, and they show a Gear VR um, in the in the videos, but they can also give away cardboard headsets to take home, um, and um, uh, and then there's another company that released a virtual reality uh, app that's a preview of your aortic operation for people who are going in for stent repairs. Uh, mm -hmm. They can get a little preview of how that will work and be able to visualize it in, in 3D if that's something you would want to see. Myself, personally, I don't want to know what the doctors are going to do because it just would gross me out too much to know. Just, you know. Knock me out and do whatever you got to do. Yeah, give me uh, a meditation one any day. <laughs> um, I also had um, uh, another company uh, that makes uh, virtual reality applications do a little overview about heavy equipment makers using virtual reality both for internal de product development because you can do a lot of prototyping in virtual reality uh, and building real prototypes is really expensive. So you can go through a lot of virtual prototypes and, and zero in on what you really want and then build those. Um, but also for marketing, because you can bring this to a trade show and you can't bring a lot of these super giant combines and tractors with you to a trade show. At least you're not going to be able to bring more than one. Um, but with a virtual reality headset, you can have people explore this and it's much more interesting and interactive than just having a catalog, which is what they used to do before. And um, and also because virtuality is cool, it will get people to your booth because they get to try out virtual reality, and they also get to see your equipment. So it's a it's a win-win for everybody. 
and that's a, that's a really growing use of virtual reality right now. And I've been seeing it pop up in all sorts of conferences, including for things where it really doesn't be- make any sense to have a virtual reality app. But, you know, it's still cool. I still went and tried it because, hey, it's virtual reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a new 360-degree camera out, uh, or will be <laughs> out. It's coming out on July 30th. It j- costs just 200 bucks and it clips to your iPhone. Um, iPhone oh. 6. <clears throat> yeah, I like, look at that. Yeah, it's very cute. Now, um, I reviewed previously a 360 fly camera. Uh, there's a $400 version and a $500 version. Um, the the resolution of the $200 Insta360 is about halfway between the two. So it's a really good deal. Um, but the 360 Fly is like a golf ball kind of camera. And you can put it down anywhere or stick it on a tripod. Uh, the, the Insta360 clips to your phone. So it's a... So I... I, I I I, would, I, would, I don't know if, if I, I I think I would prefer the golf ball kind of setup, but um, I rather like the idea of going on the golf course and whacking <clears throat> a camera and then get it be taking a drone out, wouldn't it? You just um, get your golf club and whack the golf ball into the air and it takes a whole spinning um, panorama yeah. for you. Unless it breaks, which case you just had a four hundred dollar you know. Oh no! Golf. If it's a golf ball, it better be made of sturdier stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Well. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so it's very cute. It's got two fisheye lenses, one in the front, one in the back, and they automatically stitches it together for a 360 degree photo or video. And one of the ways that people are using it, according to the demo video that they show, is a 360 degree video chat. So you're chatting with somebody, and if they have a virtual headset on, they would feel as though they're sitting across the table from you. And they can look around and see the cafe where, where you're sitting or, you know, your home or wherever you are. And that is like, seems like a really, really cool use of virtual reality. Though, like, especially for grandparents and, you know, stuff like well, that. One thing I liked, actually, was, um, <clears throat> oh, it's a few weeks ago now. I think I probably mentioned it. There was... Um, a podcast that came out. Oh, it was um, it was after one of the conventions, the all thing, I think, and it, it was a lousy, self indulgent podcast. But I love the fact that what they'd obviously done is they put a three, they'd got a round table, they put a three sixty degree camera in the center, and it simultaneously filmed all the people around the table, and you literally followed around to follow the one person that was speaking at a given point. I remember discussing that with you, yeah. yeah sad, sadly, they weren't speaking about anything of interest. <laughs> <laughs> Very geeky kind of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, but the idea was perfect because, you know, you felt like you were sitting at a, 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 were, in a chair in the room. Ex- no, except you would feel like you're sitting on a table in the middle of these people. Well, I yeah. think that a better position for the camera would have been head height on a chair. So you would feel more like a participant in the round table as opposed to like a weird interloper, like yeah. lying down in the middle of the table, you know? <laughs> right, sure. Yeah, actually, both techniques would be pretty good for different things. Right, right. Like for, okay. this, for this program, we'd have the round table, but for a discussion involving other people, you'd have it, you know, um, your way. Yeah, different use cases, yeah. No, because I've actually I've actually seen it filmed. Um, uh, what what's it called? OnePlus did this. They had a round table of users sitting around talking about the how much they loved the new smartphone, because this was a promo for their new smartphone. Mm. But but they they had you come in and sit down at a chair, so it literally felt like you were one of the participants of the round table. And it was really cool, and people would look at you. And it would feel as though people were looking and addressing you when they talked. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, if you have a camera in the middle, uh, that you know you wouldn't have the same kind of dynamic of feeling like you're present and feeling like people are talking to you. So, um, so, so I guess what, what I'm suggesting is put a camera on a stick about head height where you want the viewer to feel they are, and yeah. put a little picture of a face, you know, taped under it. <laughs> <laughs> so people would look at it. <laughs> yeah, you know the, the the systems like the Cisco telepresence. They uh, they they master that stuff really well. It's still two D, but you know they've got the yeah. eye lines and the, the all that stuff working exactly. really well. Yeah. 
yeah, lines of sight, making eye contact with people is so amazing when you're mm. in virtual reality and someone looks you in the eye and you feel like they're looking and talking to you. It is very cool. The companies that have pulled this off, I'm really impressed by. Yep. And of course, it's the centerpiece of all the porn videos. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Those actors are looking at you, you know. <laughs> I, I don't think you need a stick at head eye for that one. <laughs> no, no, they're, 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 <laughs> yeah, they're, we won't go there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. No, okay. So, if you are building a virtual reality app and you want to be based on a 3D map, EGO is a company that's made um, their 3D mapping software uh, available to developers as a platform for developing virtual reality applications. And there's a little bit of info on them. Uh, two VR arcades have opened in Illinois. Um, and they charge 10 bucks for 15 minutes for one and $5 on, on another. And um, they have HTC Vives. And one of them also has Oculuses. And they have like more than 20 different games. Um, and uh, so that's pretty cool because you can't afford this at home right now. Because, <laughs> you know, and, and also you don't want to. Really, this is first generation technology. It's going to be obsolete in a few months. And you'll have spent hundreds of dollars on something that's already obsolete. Unless you really, really, really have to be an early adopter. Uh, just buy, buy a cardboard headset to tide you over. Or buy a Gear VR to tide you over if you have the money. Um, and wait for, uh, for this stuff to improve. We already mentioned the survey about four and five young people being keen on VR. Um, uh, one interesting statistic was that smart watch owners, 61% of them were keen on VR. So I guess they like their gadgets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, was gonna, I was just going to say, because they ain't going to be looking at VR on a watch. <laughs> that is yeah. regressive. <laughs> yeah. And 53% uh, of gamers are interested in VR, which also makes sense. Actually, um, I just thought, you know, we were talking about haptic devices and that thing earlier on about the uh, <clears throat> the strap that goes on your arm. Who's to say, actually, where some of these smartwatch manufacturers couldn't actually make it as an, uh, it couldn't double as an interface device? It's got half the technology in it already. Uh, could be. Um, or we might just have, um, uh, you, you know, like that, that little camera that attached to your smartphone? Mm. I could definitely see those being built into your smartphone. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And and with depth perception, with gesture recognition, because you got to realize how fast this, st this stuff is is coming. Yeah. And once you have 3D depth perception and gesture recognition right in your smartphone, you don't need anything else. I mean, the haptics are a separate story. That's the feedback part. Mm. Um, and I don't know if we're going to have haptics like in the near future because that's something that's uh, – you, you, I don't think you can do the haptics from a small device that you carry. It has to be something external like, like, a, you know, like, a, 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 like a wind machine or what, whatever, f force field generator, whatever things that they've, they've got in the laboratories that they're cooking up um, that, that create mm. a sensation of feedback when you touch something. Um, but um, uh, other than that, I think a lot of stuff could be just built into the smartphones very quickly. Mm. Okay. Now, one thing that's not going to be able to be built into the smartphones very quickly is uh, the treadmill. And uh, Virtuix... <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see him try. <laughs> yeah. Now, you can, they can build in motion detection, you know, as you're walking along... And if it's got a camera, it can tell that you're approaching different things at a different rates, you know, and the GPS and, you know, everything else it's got, it can tell that you're moving. The Wi-Fi signals, many different ways it has to figure out that you're moving, but already built into our smartphones. Uh, but you don't want to be walking around too much, uh, you know, if, you ha if your vision is covered by up by a headset. So now they can do some of it. Um, they could like put up, you know, in-world little warnings that say that you're approaching a wall, don't go too far. And the games themselves could be designed so that they trick you into thinking you're moving in a straight line, but you're not. You're walking around in circles, but you think you're walking in a straight line. So you think you're in a big, bigger world than you are. 
But even that, you can't really do that in a small room. You have to have a big enough room that you're not aware that you're walking in a circle. Um, and also, if there's like a crack in the floor, that's enough to make you trip over it. And, and so, or, or cat runs out or something. So there, there's dangers in having fully, um, uh, you know, f free moving kind of environments. In the mm -hmm. arcades that have this with the, with the, with the HTC Vive, they have the room set up specifically for the Vive. So there's nothing on the floor, it's a smooth surface. The walls are calibrated correctly, so you're not going to bump into them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you're not going to you're not going to have that at home in a you know random yeah. home environment. Uh, so anyway, so the Virtu Xomni, this is expensive. It's about 800 bucks. Um, so this is definitely something that's designed for arcades. Um, and uh, they have just announced a joint venture with Hero Entertainment. They are a billion dollar Chinese game publisher. They've developed something called Crisis Action, which is the most popular mobile first-person shooter game in China with more than 400 million players. They will convert Crisis Action to VR gameplay that will work with the Omni. And the Hero also owns the largest eSports league in China, and they will add a competition that features the Omni. They've invested a large amount of money in the company. And Virtuix has also announced a deal where they're selling between five and 10,000 Omni units to arcades and entertainment centers in China. Wow, so that's that, impressive. Yeah. That is very impressive for the out-of-home arcade kind of setups. Um, they, they raised a million in a Kickstarter a couple of years ago, and then another six million from various investors. And they have a seed invest funding round going on right now that's going to end July 31st that allows anybody to put money into the company with a minimum investment of 1000 bucks. So this would be a good time to get into Virtuix if you have a spare $1,000 lying around. Uh, I think... <laughs> I think you know that. I mean, we were talking last week. Uh, I think it was last week, anyway, about uh, the uh, the exercise bike and the idea that you you go cycling or what to a virtual environment. So you you your mind is off the exercise and you're enjoying the environment. And I I'm not um, you know the um, the Omni as well as any other treadmill based type thing. I I think might. You know, it's big, but it's not that big. You know, if you're the kind of person that has exercise bikes in your home, I don't see why somebody who prefers running uh, wouldn't actually um, buy that for home use too. So I, th I think there's probably a market there on the fitness level for um, for those over and beyond, you know, out of the home experience. I think it might work a little bit better with the bikes and uh, maybe mm -hmm. like a little stair machine for the home experience. Be, uh, and with with you have a small number of games that you can play, but they're designed for the you know to work with that particular equipment mm. uh, because it's a little bit cheaper, a little bit more compact. It only does one thing. The Omni handles a lot of stuff. You can jump in it, you can shoot with it, you can run, you can walk, you can crouch. Um, there's all mm. sorts of stuff it can do. So um, it's it's a very flexible kind of machine it, it requires uh it's kind of hard to get into it it's not like a stairmaster would just step on it or you know a chair that you just sit in it, it it's it's you know it's much more dynamic than that yeah. um so it, it is much more uh, designed for many many you know more likely to break because there's more moving parts yeah, so, so <laughs> it's so all, it's a, and it's hard work basically. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's a better fit for an arcade, for a more specialized environment. Unless like you really, you're a really major enthusiast, or you're training for a competition, and yeah. you have to have one of these at home. Yeah. Okay, so um, so yeah, so then the other thing, if you're investing in Virtuix, uh, keep in mind that arcades have a short lifespan. Remember the video game arcades. While the video game machines were expensive, people went to the arcades. As the technology became cheap and ubiquitous and everyone had a console at home, the arcades kind of trailed off. They, they still have them, but they're not as big as they used to be. So, so the same thing with the virtual reality arcades. Right now, it, they're really on the upward swing of the cycle. It's a good time to get into that business. But keep in mind that you want to have an exit strategy. 
Um, and, and keep in mind that everyone else is also going to have an exit tra- strategy. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so it might be a little tricky to, uh, to make sure you don't lose all your money as, as, as the industry moves on. And that is it for me. And we're only oh. half an hour past our end time. So Maria, Why you, Maria, did, you you cover, talk- did you cover that Z Z camera or that Z uh, positional? Z, Z, I was curious Z. about that. It's just above the heavy equipment makers. All right, let's see. I may have uh, missed that one. Z. Oh, I see that. Yeah. So yeah, so it got it has uh, positional tracking for mobile phones, mm-hmm. and they and they have it demonstrated with a Gear VR. Um, and this, so there's a nice picture of a guy walking around inside a virtual world wearing a Gear VR with a little Z camera kind of stuck on top of it. So it's really, it's a thin little um, uh, wide, narrow and wide kind of little stick that you would put on top of the headset. Um, kind of like a pencil, but a little bigger, mm-hmm. um, a thick pencil. It costs 450 bucks, but it requires its own computer. So oh. you either have to connect it to a computer using their t- mm. their 150 foot cable, or you have to have a separate module, which is going to cost you around 500 bucks, that you would carry. Um, so uh, it's it's like an early kind of thing, but mm-hmm. it's not really practical in any sense. It also isn't capable of tracking head head gestures. It only knows that you're walking around and what your environment looks like. And it okay. records uh, the video of the sur- surrounding stuff. Interesting, okay. So um, uh, it, it's recording 110 degree virtual reality video. So it's not 360 degrees, it's just the stuff that's in front of you. Mm-hmm. Because the stuff that's behind the camera obviously is your forehead and that's not a particularly great view, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And it can't record down because all that's under it is the Gear VR headset. So, um, so it's not 360 degrees, uh, and uh, so so they're thinking of something like this being built into the camera in the future. And again, this goes back to my idea of all this stuff is going to be built in. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's a nice idea. Um, I mean, it's great that they're innovating in this technology, but I'm not seeing a lot of practical applications of it just now. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. And uh, so thanks for reminding me of that. And I think um, that should be everything. Yep. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm just um, I'm just opening a couple of other things. Oh, it doesn't want to open. I, why do these things not open when you're meant to? There we are. Oh, spring wires in your inbox. Um <clears throat> I don't think this is on Twitter, but I thought it would ever mention uh, <clears throat> Tumblr, T-U-M-B-L-R. Uh, there is an online web tool that actually can convert your Tumblr uh, feed into a virtual reality gallery. Uh, t- Tumblr, hmm. um, I, I actually use Tumblr to post um, videos and um, some pictures and uh, link articles, but a lot of people use it a bit like Pinterest, you know, they just pin pictures to it that they like. And uh, what this tool will do is it will t- it will make up a picture on a wall of a virtual gallery of each of your Tumblr posts, and um, people can then go to TumVR, T-U-M-B-V-R, <laughs> and, and they, can load, they can load your blog and view it as an art gallery um, on the wall. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, a bit of fun there. A bit of fun there, I thought. It uses, uh, it's created using Frame VR and Node JavaScript. And it can be viewed using Oculus um, or compatible browsers as well. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> nice to see uh, virtuality <laughs> blogs getting in on the act, as it were. <laughs> um, right, um, right, that's the browser. Okay. Um, <clears throat> From Second Life News, um, Shivers Unleashed, leashed, um, let's see if I can load that one too, it's an international music festival being held in Second Life, um, and 
depending on Microsoft. Oh yeah, this is a this is actually you know a Pay's blog, modemworld.me, M O D E M W O R L D. And oh, don't you just love Microsoft's browser? It doesn't my. Thank you. Oh, no. uh, I've right. used it for a long time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, this started on Friday and actually finishes today. So actually, this isn't really that helpful. But if you've got time today and you're in Second Life, um, you might want to uh, go to this music festival. I'm um, just... Um, right. Uh, oh, hang on. I'll just put my glasses on because I can tell you the region um, by mousing over the thing. Uh, it's a region called Sea Lakes, uh, two words. So it's S-E-A space... L A K E S, and um, I guess that will be on American time. So you've got a few hours um, before the end of that festival uh, in World, if you want to see that. And um, yeah, just scrolling down here, just check that I haven't um, missed anything. It's always good to have the extra couple of minutes <laughs> for this stuff. Um, uh, exhibition opened uh, open today. Uh, the LEA 13 region, and it's called SNARL, S A N, uh, sorry, S N A R L. And um, I've also been posting quite a lot of vis- videos of that, which have been uh, filmed in advance. It's been getting a lot of coverage, so I guess they had it open uh, well in advance for reviewers and things. And uh, more on that music festival, just scanning down here. I'm actually looking at my Melbourne's underscore writer Twitter feed here, which is where there's a hell of a lot of um, films and machinima, plus arts and um, other good destinations. Um, But I think, um, yeah, I think it's mostly films this week and nothing of great importance. Some great dance videos, actually, by the way, um, by the uh, Sky Dancers and various um, in-world performance groups. Um, There were a whole bunch of them came up this week in rapid succession. But, um, yeah, I think I'm I'm done with that. All my other notes in Slack here are covered or lost, whichever. Right. Uh, And... um, (laughs) So the one other thing that I want to talk about uh, today that's Mm. not really VR related is I got the new Pokemon Go game. Oh, yes. Oh, God. Yeah, I I had that on my list to mention, too. Yeah, so everybody's playing this. (laughs) And the way it works is that you give it permission to track where you are, and you hold up the phone, and you look through it like like it's a camera or a little window. And uh, if you look in the right direction, there might be a Pokemon there that you can catch. Uh, with with the game, and it, it's really inspiring people to walk around and you know go different places around their uh, around their hometowns, and uh, there's uh, spots where like Pokemon gather and uh, all sorts of in-game dynamics that make it a little social outdoor, doing a lot of walking kind of game, which is kind of cool. It gets us out there. Uh, it was and, so funny. There was a, somebody posted on LinkedIn, and I liked it actually. The the, uh, the headline about the uh, generations of Pokemon users suddenly discover physical exercise. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the, the idea right, of the right. name, you know, it's so much of a computer game that now people they're having to get out of their chairs and do exercise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but actually, it sounds like fun. Actually, it, in a way, it, is, it is fun. Yeah, and mm. it's an AR game. So when people talk about, and I'm, I think we talked about this before, when people talk about the market predictions for VR versus AR, when they say that AR is going to be huge, this is the kind of thing that they're talking about. Uh, the, that, you know, that takes a surrounding reality and adds you know, little interesting things to it. Whether it's a translation of the text on a sign or a little Pokemon that, that you know, hides under the bushes. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a cute and easy thing that our current smartphones can already do without any kind of updates or new investment. So mm-hmm. definitely there's a lot of potential there because, you know, anybody can do an app like this. And the fact that Pokemon created this first, I think, is is kind of interesting. That's a, already a big, big um, brand uh, from mm-hmm. what I <clears throat> understand. Oh, yeah, yeah, so- <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. No, well, they yeah. go back. They go back to Nintendo, I think, uh, the early consoles or something. You know, they've they're, they've been around. <laughs> and they've had a TV show, and they've had trading. I think they've had trading cards, and 
and so on. And uh, have I talked to you guys about Minecraft in VR before? Um, I just went yeah. back and tried it out again um, because my first experience kind of made me queasy, but they've uh, revamped the interface a little bit to make it a little bit less motion sickness inducing. Hmm. And um, I actually played it for quite a while and I did not mind it. And it was a lot of fun. And when it rained, you, know, you actually felt like you're standing out there in the rain. Hmm. And when a giant spider was coming at you, it kind of felt like a giant spider was coming at you. It's a very cute game. I think that if you like Minecraft, that game alone is enough to buy the Gear VR for. You know, it's it's really mm -hmm. cool. And the game itself is just seven bucks. So definitely worth it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not currently recommending that anybody buy a Gear VR because we've got the Google Daydream platform coming out soon. Uh, Samsung's rumored to be working on the, the, the next version of the of the headset and so on and so forth. Um, but I think if, if you do buy it now, there's enough stuff out there to make you happy with it anyway. Yeah, yeah it's a bit like, any, I suppose it's the same of any technology, but especially computer type devices, it's never a good time to buy. The moment, <laughs> the moment you invest in one, the manufacturer brings out the bang smacking new version that's the same price and twice as good, you know? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Uh, with like my computers, I bought my computer several years ago. I still don't have any particular urge to upgrade. No, because no. it's just it's just fine. The new ones doesn't have anything that I'm missing right now. Uh, with VR, though, it's changing so rapidly, so quickly, that that is definitely an issue. Well, even the computer is, because if you're going to use any kind of tethered headset, you're going to need to have a CPU, a new computer that's capable of running the 90 frames a second and everything else that's uh, right, right. It requires. But, yeah, so. but aside from VR... Yeah. There really is no reason for anyone to upgrade their PC right now. Oh, sure, no, but they're, yeah. they're PC, PCs are old hats. And anyway, the, uh, the the world's ubiquitous operating system has collapsed on itself by the look of it. Yep. <laughs> interesting, interesting that the um, Windows 10 Anniversary Edition, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> has um, a Ubuntu Linux, in other words, shell. What? Um, it's called Ubuntu Bash or something, and you can, when you're in Windows, you can immediately switch to a Linux environment. Now, that puzzled me. <laughs> why? I mean, great, but why? I mean, I, I have so many people running away to Linux that they think they're going to have to stick Linux in Windows to go. <laughs> a very, very odd revelation that. Apparently, all the, you know, the people that have the, um, uh, insider edition and found this um, um, environment in it and um, you just launch this and you're in, <laughs> you're in an open source environment away from Windows it's that Windows is presumably hogging all the processor and memory in the background but that's another matter very 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 old thing that now you just reminded me uh, before we stop actually and um, you were talking uh, with the Pokemon there. I think a Pokemon, say Pokemon. <laughs> um, it just sounds fun. But um, J um, yeah, James, you were there. It was about three or four weeks ago. One of the one of the last events on Ibiza Safari. We went to visit, and I've forgotten the name of it already. Where they gave us a hut, and we were following clues. Oh right, right. And it, you know the one. Basically, you got a hut, which <laughs> when, if you teleport with it out, still on, you can't ever get it off. It was the on this the... morning when I when I logged in here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you actually the only way to do it is when whenever they bring the grid back online, you'll have to teleport there to go there and they could take it off right. it's very not very annoying but but the the game was kind of fun because you put the HUD on and you clicked an object near the start and it activated the HUD and gave you a first clue and it was to find a spade or something and it said you know Fred Bloggs can tell you about the spade and this is the hardest bit when you start you've got to wander around the whole region until you come to an animated figure or an NPC of um, Fred Bloggs. When you finally found him, he'll be holding a spade. You click on the spade, it gives you the spade, and then the, the HUD gives you your next clue, and you've got to go and find some soil to dig in. 
and apparently the soil is adjacent to another avatar called Feblogs 2, uh, etc., etc., right? Now, um, <laughs> elementary but fun, apart from not being able to get this hut off. But it occurred to me, um, and you reiterated it when you were talking about Pokemon, actually, uh, Pokemon, just to make sure you don't think I'm talking about playing cards, um, that um, presumably the Pokemon app is a self-contained app where it overlays the Pokemon at random on whatever you're seeing through your camera. In other words, it doesn't. It's not so um, the manufacturers have put beacons all over the place in real life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that anyway. So that I was sort of sort of question for Maria, but maybe she doesn't know. But I do seem to remember another spot. Oh, I, I had my mic turned off, so I was oh. so I was actually answering a question. So they're not real physical beacons in the world. They're more like virtual beacons, kind of like Yelp has a check-in thing when you're near a certain destination. Oh, it is that. So, yeah. So they have like hot spots in like a museum and police. Some police station has a hot spot, and they had a problem that they were like, people stop visiting the police station to catch your Pokemons. You know, you can catch yeah. them outside without coming in. There was there was a, a Pokemon walk in a, some Australian park where somebody posted that, you know, anybody want to join them to hunt for their Pokemons? Like 5,000 people responded. Yeah. And 1,000 mm -hmm. people showed up um, that day, I think yesterday. So uh, so there's – and you can um, – I think I think they might have a deal where you can pay to have your place be a, a hot spot. Like, like you can pay uh, to uh, okay. promote it on Yelp, I think. But uh, I, I don't know if that's in place yet or not. I but, that's yeah. – that's actually good because I, I I thought you know if the Pokemon can actually hide behind something hide behind something on your camera it's going to have to know the location not just the view that you're seeing. No, um, I, I, don't so, think actually, I don't think they're actually hiding behind it. I was kind of like speaking metaphorically. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're more more like sitting on top of surfaces, like they'll be on the ground under a bush, for example. You know, but but it, they'll be visible in your camera. They won't be like behind the branches or behind the leaves. I, yeah. At least I haven't seen that yet. I mean, maybe they'll get it's smarter and do that. Sophisticated, if it was, yeah. Because mm -hmm. they would require a distance measurement in order to be able to do mm -hmm. that. And so right uh, now they just put like an overlay over the picture of your uh, of your view. Okay, then that's good because I love this idea that uh, uh, beacons. I mean, they are uh, they are virtual beacons, but they're still beacons. They rely on. A hot spot in the real world, so to speak. And I, I remembered that there was in London here um, a kind of um, treasure hunt thing that was done with mobile phones, uh, augmented reality, where um, beacons were planted all over the sort of place and you got clues and you had to go and find the beacon. And, you know, when you did finally get there, then in augmented reality it registered. And then it gave you the next clues, so you were constantly following these clues around London. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I think that's great because you know it's just it's not virtual reality or anything, but it's just, um, it, in fact, it's b barely augmented reality except you're looking at the beacons through your camera. But it's it's just a fun way to take tours and discover things, you know. So um, yeah, yeah it, it I love. It can be pretty compelling. I, I played the game Ingress, I N G R E S S. That was on the, the Google Android platform, and it was you know you can really get involved with the story in the sense that you know you're going to all these uh, locations to to map the invasion or defend against the invasion. <laughs> and I was on a light rail in Seattle, and I was you know transporting from the airport, and someone noticed me and got out their phone, and we started doing working together. It was pretty fun. <laughs> Oh, it's, a, it's a, it is social VR. Yeah. Or social, it's social it, AR, it can, we say. It can be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's great stuff. So you know, the, the world is sort of exciting possibilities, <laughs> even though Have you seen the story about the muggers using Pokemon Go? No. <laughs> so what they've been doing was they've been uh, putting their beacons, the virtual beacons, in some out of the way location. And to oh. get people to come in to this isolated spot, and then they were t were mugging them. <laughs> oh God! That's terrible. <laughs> God, they. God. Hmm. That uh, only in America. 
I yes, but but uh, you know, obvious. Uh, I actually, I don't know if it, where was it. These these stories are all international these days. Yeah, yeah I suppose so. so. Yeah, it's in St. Louis. Yeah, that's in the United States. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you just get a load of beacons, create a, create, create a game, and then start mugging people for their phones, and then go into business saying second-hand phones. So. <laughs> now you have to keep in mind that you you are mugging people that who are in the process of using their smartphone. So they can call the cops on you. So yeah, right, right. <laughs> so and, and, and they may have five. Well. And, yeah, and of course, anybody who's sensible has got find my phone switch on as well. Which yeah. um, I think of course are getting savage at this now. But for a long time, you know, the type of person that nicked, <laughs> nicked, the, nicked uh, you know, an iPhone when it was casually, you know, available. <laughs> didn't realize that they could be tracked <laughs> right um, I always found that rather amusing that's why I feel safe with a valuable Apple product when I'm in the street because if somebody does rip it off I'll find, follow them <laughs> oh yes, yes. Um, you, okay so the beacons are called pokey stops yeah and you can use real world money to put virtual stuff on your pokey spot to make it more attractive for people to come there Cool. Uh, it's very good. I, I mean, the other thing I did read in the week is that the release of the app has been withdrawn from certain countries or held back to certain countries already because of oversubscription. I mean, it's the number one selling app of the week everywhere <laughs> um, that, that you can actually guess is. And apparently, the, you know, the, 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 I, I, I think it's what we call the scaling problem in real life. You know, to, too many people... <laughs> Are following these things around and convening, you know. Um, you know, you've got, a, I don't know, a, a, a park that can hold 2,000 people comfortably. The last thing you want is 10,000 people, you know. It's, you know, it, I, I can see how it could easily, um, you know, it could bring in business, but it might bring in more business than you can actually possibly handle. <laughs> so, quite amusing in a way. Okay. Um, well, James, James, uh, uh, a lot of comments today, but um, any, any, anything on your mind uh, this week that um, neither of us have covered kind of thing or of interest? Uh, you know, I, I thought I had something when I started the show, but I think I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I know, too much information. Right, too right. My mind's gone in so many different directions, but <laughs> no, I, I don't think I have anything to contribute. Yeah, I, I always keep wondering how many notebooks I should be opening before the show oh, starts. I, I, was, I did have one um, thing. I had one thing to contribute. This nothing uh, particular event, but I uh, was reading a post somewhere about this concept that we're actually living in a simulation. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and it was interesting because the author had posited something that happens in our virtual environments is that we only render things that people are looking at to save processing mm -hmm. time and bandwidth. And so mm -hmm. evidence of actually being in a virtual environment would be that type of situation, you know, optimization. And they posited that the, um, the quantum physics behavior of a particle is only in one place when it's observed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. they said that was the, that was the evidence that we're in a, uh, an optimized uh, virtual environment. <laughs> that's, thought, oh, that's pretty cool. It gave me some yeah. thought. Yeah, yeah. maybe yep. it's true. Well, I, I personally yeah. think that, and, and there's arguments made uh, for this fact that's extremely likely, because um, if you look at um, civilization, say it's going to be around for a particular length of time, as, as soon as it hits a certain point of tool development, you start getting into the virtual reality creation, and we're going to have virtual reality environments. And so the odds that we're living in something that was created before then, which is a finite length of time, versus something after that, which is a virtually unlimited length of time, is higher. That mm. we're like on the virtual reality side of it, rather than the pre-virtual reality side of it. And then once you, once you assume, okay, we have virtual reality, then you think, okay, so we have this ability to create a perfect virtual reality that we're living in. Um, so what will make that fun? And one of the things that make it fun and that will feel really real is that, you know, we, we our senses are limited to that virtual reality. Yeah. That we feel like we're, we're totally immersed. Mm -hmm. Not just immersed like in a game, like when we close our eyes and or look away 
and we can see that mm. you know we're actually in our living rooms but like fully immersed where we're only aware of the world around us until the simulation or the game ends and we come back out of it and um, I think it's interesting that pretty much every major religion says something to the effect that life is a dream or life isn't real that our actual existence is something separate from this Mm -hmm. That this is a finite experience, that it ends, that we continue to exist outside of this experience, and that, um, uh, and, th and this is something that's pretty much universal. And a lot of people mm. have spirit, personal spiritual experiences that that convince them that that there is something else beyond what we're experiencing here, which is also seems to be universal. And I think I... if you combine both of those things, then I think that's a that's a pretty high likelihood. Then it seems pretty likely, yeah. And I I I, I puzzled I puzzled about this. I mean, I I, I wouldn't want to gamble on either side, actually. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I think it's more possible because I I often think, um, and it's allied to this, of like our senses, for example. Now we're commonly thought to have six senses. Um, uh, no, five. Uh, is it five or six? I don't know. Five, but yeah. I mean, uh, there, there are there are things like um, that. I suspect early humans had um, things like senses, if you can call it a sense, like empathy, which we still acknowledge, but we don't think of as an active sense anymore. But we have grown to the point of complexity where that that particular sense, if empathy is a sense, has diminished. It might even be related to, um, uh, you know, suggested things like telepathy. It's not impossible that far enough back in time where we haven't really got a record, humans somehow how uh, you know, some kind of, oh. albeit oh, limited. Our, oh, our feelings of empathy have been increasing dramatically throughout history. Um, one of the books, uh, I think I talked about this before, The Better Angels of Our Nature, actually mm -hmm. tracks our feelings of kinship with people. And it used to be that, you know, your family against everyone else, then your clan against everyone else, then your country yeah. against everyone else. And now, due to the growth of communication technology, we, we're starting to think of people everywhere as people yeah. like us. You know, yeah. everyone is a fan of Michael Jackson. Everyone is, you know, involved in, in our personal hobby. And with the YouTube and with everything, BuzzFeed and everything else, we're starting to get more and more casual lifestyle kind of news from everyone on the planet instantly and we're much feeling much more connected to something that bad something bad happens to somebody on the other side of the planet we yeah. feel bad for them and before we'd be like oh they're just heathens they don't yeah. even have souls you know yeah, <laughs> why are they bothering to live right <laughs> well, uh, some people have said virtual or empathy machines too but i mean it's uh you know i i, I tend to agree there it's like i think empathy is it, it, you know because i think of it as probably a sense you know was another sense rather because you can't you can't say it's just a combination of any existing senses so i think it has to be called um, it actually be, you know, it has to be a sense. And I, yeah, maybe I think in the modern age, we are international age, we are reawakening to that. You know, the communications are reawakening our ability to be at one with people anywhere and everywhere. Um, if we want to be, of course, <laughs> there's some people we don't want to be. And you know, the, the same applies the other way around. There are some people I discover um electronically or in real life who i have no empathy for ever you know with whatsoever it's kind of one of those instant things you sort of click i think when you meet somebody um to different uh, different degrees but i you know i just thought of it like as you know um it's possibly something that was totally essential for our survival in in earlier times and that we would have been, you know, endowed with senses that were appropriate for those times. And, you know, just as our physical forms have changed with evolution and things like that. And, you know, just from early humans, I'm not going to try going further back than that. Um, you know, then we've adapted. But, you know, when I start thinking about the nature of time, um, not so much time travel, but the way it works, it, whether it's whether there is such a thing as linear time or whether it is something else it is simply a false dimension that is not actually linear you know I, I, I sort of muse about these things in a funny way and then I think well 
you know, what if I want to map, you know, I can draw a line on a page and um, one dimension. I can draw another line to be two dimensions. I can draw another line coming up at the right angle and tilt it so that I can see it. And I have three dimensions. Where do I draw the line for the fourth or fifth, etc.? Now, I, I suspect that those uh, the answers to that are really obvious, but I think it is in the limited nature of humans that we can't. Maybe we can build computers that will work out one day but I don't think we have the mental capacity to take the leap to visualize the line of the next dimension but if we are a simulation then clearly like uh, we are confined avatars in three dimensions and the other dimensions are actually there but we just don't perceive them um, I mean is it possible for example that the void between, um, say, Earth and the Moon and other stars, other planets, what we could describe as empty space is only empty space because we see it as empty space. Maybe there's a whole load of invisible things that we can either perceive that kind of network it all together and it's like a solid lump, but our perceptions don't allow us to see um, beyond, it's about a bit like looking at a, um, a statue built with built with prims. Um, you know, you know what you see. Um, you know, uh, but it's hollow inside. Whereas the suggestibility, but we believe it to be solid. So equally, we could there are quite possible things that are seen to be nothingness to us, which are actually tangible, it's just we move within them, we can't like fish in the sea or something, and it's water, we can't actually perceive them, and we're, we're forever limited by those creatures we are, we're not endowed with fourth dimensional fifth dimensional observational facilities, so you know, we can work out they're there but we can't work out what they are and let, let alone witness them because it, we, we don't have the senses to actually see them. So when, when I think of things like that, I think, well, maybe, you know, maybe we must be virtual because we're deliberately limited, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, but then again, some, our, our understanding of something may just suddenly become crystal clear and we'll, we'll suddenly find ourselves being able to visualize what the fourth dimension is. Or oh, and what it is, it may not be time. You know, it could be anything. So yeah, I'm 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 a <laughs> amateur philosopher here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's enjoyable. All right, and yeah. we could talk about this for a long time. We could indeed. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, well, uh, we're approaching the length of last week's show. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious me! Okay, well, final thoughts then. Anything else from you, James? No, nope, that's it. <laughs> okay, anything else from you, Maria? No, that's it for me too. Okay. Well, in that case, it better be it for me too. So, <laughs> uh, if you want news throughout the week, do follow us on Twitter. You can find me at twitter.com slash malburns, or one word, M-A-L-B-U-R-N-S, or indeed you can follow me at twitter.com slash malburns underscore writer, or malburns space writer will probably do. That's my Second Life avatar name, and you can find various uh, magazines, machinima, arts, destinations kind of stuff inside for virtual worlds on that blog as opposed to general stuff on my main one and you can also follow Maria at uh, twitter.com slash Maria Koroloff and you can follow Hypergrid Business at twitter.com slash Hypergrid Business oh, very easy really isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that will keep you going to next week and then we will be back here same time same place um, different mindset maybe next week so for now I'm going to go wish you oh well I've got to thank everybody here all two of them uh, so um, thanks uh, for multitasking on our cameras and also being on the um, hot seats James McLeod thank you James oh absolutely and I uh, you know I say it every week but I do I've learned something new amazing things this week <laughs> yeah, that's, how, that's how it should be we all do and thank you of course to Maria Karloff from Hyper Good Business thanks Maria well always a pleasure to be here very good and a pleasure to have you too yes. <laughs> okay that's it so I'm going to wish you all a very good morning very good afternoon very good evening 
and possibly indeed a very good tomorrow depending on wherever and whenever you are and um, for now we're out of here but we'll see you soon bye for now <laughs>